Ms. Hirono, Mr. Hoven, Mrs. Hyde-Smith, Mr. Johnson. Mr. Kane, Mr. Kelly, Mr. Kennedy, Mr. King. Ms. Klobuchar, Mr. Lankford, Mr. Lee, Mr. Lujan. Ms. Lummis, Mr. Manchin, Mr. Markey, Mr. Marshall. Mr. McConnell, Mr. Menendez, Mr. Merkley, Mr. Moran. <laughs> 
Mr. Mullen, Ms. Murkowski, Mr. Murphy, Mrs. Murray. Mr. Ossoff, Mr. Padilla, Mr. Paul, Mr. Peters. Mr. Reed, Mr. Ricketts, Mr. Risch, Mr. Romney. Ms. Rosen, Mr. Rounds, Mr. Rubio, Mr. Sanders. Mr. Schatz, Mr. Schmidt, Mr. Schumer, Mr. Scott of Florida. Mr. Scott of South Carolina, Mrs. Shaheen, Ms. Cinema, Ms. Smith. Ms. Stabenow, Mr. Sullivan, Mr. Tester, Mr. Thune. 
Mr. Tillis, Mr. Tuberville, Mr. Van Hollen, Mr. Vance. Mr. Warner, Mr. Warnock, Ms. Warren, Mr. Welch. Mr. Whitehouse, Mr. Wicker, Mr. Wyden, Mr. Young. Majority leaders recognized. Any senator who was not in the Senate chamber at the time the oath was administered to the other senators will make the fact known to the chair so that the oath may be administered as soon as possible to the Senate, to the senator. The sergeant at arms will make the proclamation. Hear ye, hear ye, hear ye. All persons are commanded to keep silent under pain of imprisonment while the Senate of the United States is convened as a court of impeachment to consider the articles of impeachment against Alejandro N. Mayorkas, Secretary of Homeland Security. Madam President. Majority leaders recognize. In a moment, I will ask unanimous consent to allow for debate time, to allow for Republicans to offer and have votes on trial resolutions, and allow for Republicans to offer and have votes on points of order. So, I ask unanimous consent that Senator Lee be recognized to offer a resolution that is the text of S.R.S. 624, the full Senate trial, that Senator Cruz be recognized to offer a resolution that is the text of S.R.S. 622, the trial committee, that there then be up to 60 minutes of debate on the resolutions, concurrently and equally divided between the two leaders or their designees. And following the use or yielding back of that time, the Senate vote on or in relation to the resolutions in the order listed, with no amendments to the resolutions in order. Further, that following the disposition of the trial resolutions, if they are not agreed to, Senator Schumer or his designee be recognized to make a motion to dismiss the first article of impeachment, that the motion be subject to only seven points of order, that there be up to 60 minutes for debate concurrently and equally divided on the motion to dismiss and the points of order, and that following the use or yielding back of that time, the Senate vote in relation to the points of order in the order raised and the motion to dismiss. Further, 
that if Senator Schumer or his designee makes a motion to dismiss the second article of impeachment, that the motion be subject to only one point of order, that there be up to 60 minutes for debate, concurrently and equally divided, on the motion to dismiss and the points of order, and that following the use or yielding back of that time, the Senate vote in relation to the points of order in the order raised and the motion to dismiss. Following that further, the disposition, further disposition of Article 2, the Senate vote on the motion to adjourn the Court of Impeachment sine die. Finally, that there be up to four minutes for debate equally divided between the two leaders or their designees prior to each roll call vote, all without intervening action or debate. Is there an objection? Madam President. Senator from Missouri. Reserving my right to object. To dismiss or table articles of impeachment against Secretary Mayorkas without a trial here today or in committee is an unprecedented move by Senator Schumer. Never before in the history of our republic has the Senate dismissed or tabled articles of impeachment when the impeached individual was alive and had not resigned. As Senator Schumer said in 2020, quote, a fair trial has witnesses, a fair trial has relevant documents as part of the record, a fair trial seeks the truth, nothing more, nothing less. I will not assist Senator Schumer in setting our Constitution ablaze and bulldozing 200 years of precedent. Therefore, I object. Madam President. Object objection is heard. Madam President, I raise a point of order that impeachment article one does not allege conduct that rises to the level of a high crime or misdemeanor as required under article two, section four of the United States Constitution and is therefore unconstitutional. Uh, under the precedents and practices of the Senate, the chair has no power or authority to pass on such a point of order. The chair, therefore, under the precedence of the Senate, submits the question to the Senate. Is the point of order well taken? The Republican leader is recognized. Clerk will call the roll. Ms. Baldwin.
Mr. Barrasso. Mr. Bennett. Mrs. Blackburn. Mr. Blumenthal. Mr. Booker. Mr. Bozeman. Mr. Braun. Mrs. Brett. Mr. Brown. Mr. Bud. Mrs. Capucho, Mr. Cardin, Mr. Carper, Mr. Casey, Mr. Cassidy, Ms. Collins, Mr. Coons, Mr. Cornyn, Ms. Cortez Masto, Mr. Cotton. <laughs> Mr. Kramer. Mr. Crapo. Mr. Cruz. Mr. Danes. Ms. Duckworth. Mr. Durbin. Ms. Ernst. Mr. Fetterman. Mrs. Fisher. Mrs. Gillibrand. Mr. Graham. Mr. Grassley. Mr. Haggerty. Ms. Hassan. Mr. Hawley. Mr. Heinrich. Mr. Hickenlooper. Mr. Rono. Mr. Hoven. Mrs. Hyde Smith. Mr. Johnson. Mr. Kane. Mr. Kelly. Mr. Kennedy. No, Mr. King. Ms. Klobuchar. Mr. Langford. Mr. Lee. Mr. Lujan. Ms. Lummis. Mr. Manchin. Mr. Markey. Mr. Marshall. Mr. McConnell, Mr. Menendez, Mr. Berkeley, Mr. Moran, Mr. Mullen, Ms. Murkowski, Mr. Murphy, Mrs. Murray, Mr. Ossoff, Mr. Padilla, Mr. Paul, Mr. Peters, Mr. Reed, Mr. Ricketts, Mr. Rich, Mr. Romney, 
Miss Rosen. Mr. Rounds. Mr. Rubio. Mr. Sanders. Mr. Schatz. Mr. Schmidt. Mr. Schumer. Mr. Scott of Florida. Mrs. Shaheen. Miss Cinema. Miss Smith. Miss Stanley. Mr. Sullivan, Mr. Tester, Mr. Thune, Mr. Tillis, Mr. Tuberville, Mr. Van Hollen, Mr. Vance, Mr. Warner, Mr. Warnock, Ms. Warren, Mr. Welch. Mr. Whitehouse, Mr. Wicker, Mr. Wyman.
Mr. Young. Quorum is present. The Senate is considering the point of order presented by the Majority Leader. I'm present. Senator from Texas. Madam President, I rise to make a motion. The Majority Leader has argued that Secretary Mayorkas's defiance of federal immigration law and active aiding and abetting of the worst criminal invasion in our nation's history does not constitute a high crime or misdemeanor. He has presented no argument on that question. He has presented no briefing on that question. And the position is directly contrary to the Constitution, to the original understanding of the Constitution at the time it was ratified, and to the explicit position of the Biden Department of Justice as argued before the Supreme Court of the United States. The majority leader's position is asking members of this Senate to vote on political expediency to avoid listening to arguments. The only rational way to resolve this question is actually to debate it, to consider the Constitution and consider the law. The Senator will recognize that the Senate is in a non-debatable position. The Senator has a right to offer his point of order uh, but, or his motion, but the, we are in a non-debatable position. And my motion is to change that so that we can actually debate the law if Senators care what the Constitution and law says. I therefore move that the Senate proceed to closed session to allow for deliberation on the question as required by Impeachment Rule 24. Madam President. Majority Leader. In our previous consent request, we gave your side a chance for debate in public where it should be. And your side objected. We are moving forward. The question is on the motion. Ask for the yeas and nays. Is there a sufficient second? There is a suffi sufficient uh, a second. The clerk will call the roll. Ms. Baldwin. Mr. Barrasso. Mr. Bennett. Mrs. Blackburn. Mr. Blumenthal. Mr. Booker. Mr. Bozeman. Mr. Braun. Mrs. Britt. Aye. Mr. Brown. No. Mr. Budd. Aye. Ms. Butler. No. Ms. Cantwell. No. Mrs. Capito. Aye. Mr. Cardin. No. Mr. Carper. No. Mr. Casey. No. Mr. Cassidy. Aye. Ms. Collins. Aye. Mr. Coons. Mr. Cornyn, Aye. Ms. Cortez Masto, Aye. Mr. Cotton, Aye. Mr. Kramer, Mr. Crapo, Aye. Mr. Cruz, Aye. Mr. Danes, Aye. Ms. Duckworth, Aye. Mr. Durbin, Aye. Ms. Ernst, Aye. Mr. Fetterman, Aye. Mrs. Fisher, Aye. Mrs. Gillibrand, Mr. Graham, Aye. Mr. Grassley, Aye. Mr. Haggerty, Aye. Ms. Hassan, no. Mr. Hawley, Aye. Mr. Heinrich, no. Mr. Hickenlooper, no. Mr. Rono, no. Mr. Hoven, Aye. Mrs. Hydesmith, Mr. Johnson, Aye. Mr. Kane, no. Mr. Kelly, Mr. Kennedy, Aye. Mr. King, no. Ms. Klobuchar, Aye. Mr. Langford, Aye. Mr. Lee, Aye. Mr. Lujan, no. Ms. Lummis, Mr. Manchin, no. Mr. Markey, Aye. Mr. Marshall, Aye. Mr. McConnell, Aye. Mr. Menendez, Mr. Merkley, no. Mr. Moran, Aye. Mr. Mullen, Aye. Ms. Murkowski, Aye. Mr. Murphy, no. Mrs. Murray, no. Mr. Ossoff, no. Mr. Padilla, no. Mr. Paul, Aye. Mr. Peters, no. Mr. Reed, Mr. Ricketts, Aye. Mr. Risch, Aye. 
Mr. Romney. Ms. Rosen. Mr. Rounds. Mr. Rubio. Mr. Sanders. Mr. Schatz. Mr. Schmidt. Mr. Schumer. Mr. Scott of Florida. Mr. Scott of South Carolina. Mrs. Shaheen. No. Ms. Cinema. No. Ms. Smith. No. Ms. Stabenow. No. Mr. Sullivan. Aye. Mr. Tester. No. Mr. Thune. Aye. Mr. Tillis. Aye. Mr. Tuberville. Aye. Mr. Van Hollen. No. Mr. Vance. Aye. Mr. Warner. <coughs> Mr. Warnock. No. Ms. Warren. Mr. Welch. No. Mr. Whitehouse. No. Mr. Wicker. Aye. Mr. Wyden. No. Mr. Young. Aye. The nays are 51, the, the yeas are 51, 49, the nays are 51, the motion is not agreed to. The pending order is the motion made by the uh, majority leader on the point of order. Madam President. Senator from Louisiana. Madam President, I have a motion. I think my motion takes precedent. Um, having heard 
Senator Schumer's serious allegations, which in my judgment are specious, about the constitutionality of, uh, of these impeachment proceedings, we find ourselves in the awkward position, because we're in impeachment proceedings, of being able, unable to discuss in public uh, the, the merits of Senator Schumer's claim. And at the same time, my Democratic friends have refused to go into closed session so we can discuss it. But so for Senator, that reason, please. Madam President, I move we adjourn this court of impeach impeachment immediately until 12 o'clock noon on Tuesday, April 30th, and I ask for the yeas and nays. Is there a sufficient second? There is a sufficient second. The clerk will call the roll. Ms. Baldwin. Yeah. Mr. Barrasso. Aye. Mr. Bennett. Yeah. Mrs. Blackburn. Aye. Mr. Blumenthal. Yeah. Mr. Booker. No. Mr. Bozeman. Aye. Mr. Braun. Aye. Mrs. Britt. Aye. Mr. Brown. No. Mr. Budd. Ms. Butler, no. Ms. Cantwell, no. Mrs. Capito, no. Mr. Carden, no. Mr. Carper, no. Mr. Casey, no. Mr. Cassidy, no. Ms. Collins, no. Mr. Coons, no. Mr. Cornyn, no. Ms. Cortez Masto, no. Mr. Cotton, Mr. Kramer, Mr. Crapo, Mr. Cruz, Mr. Danes, Ms. Duckworth, Mr. Durbin, Ms. Ernst, Mr. Fetterman, Mrs. Fisher, Mrs. Gillibrand, Mr. Graham, Mr. Grassley, Aye. Mr. Haggerty, Aye. Ms. Hassan, Aye. Mr. Hawley, Aye. Mr. Heinrich, Aye. Mr. Hickenlooper, Aye. Ms. Hirono, Aye. Mr. Hoven, Aye. Mrs. Hyde Smith, Aye. Mr. Johnson, Aye. Mr. Kane, Aye. Mr. Kelly, Mr. Kennedy, Aye. Mr. King, no. Ms. Klobuchar, no. Mr. Lankford, Aye. Mr. Lee, Aye. Mr. Lujan, no. Ms. Lummis, Aye. Mr. Manchin, no. Mr. Markey, no. Mr. Marshall, Aye. Mr. McConnell, Aye. Mr. Menendez, Mr. Merkley, Mr. Moran, Mr. Mullen, Aye. Ms. Murkowski, Aye. Mr. Murphy, no. Mrs. Murray, no. Mr. Ossoff, Mr. Padilla, no. Mr. Paul, Aye. Mr. Peters, no. Mr. Reed, no. Mr. Ricketts, Aye. Mr. Risch, Mr. Romney, Ms. Rosen, Mr. Rounds, Mr. Rubio, Mr. Sanders, Mr. Schatz, Mr. Schmidt, Mr. Schumer, Mr. Scott of Florida, Mr. Scott of South Carolina, Mrs. Shaheen, Ms. Cinema, Ms. Smith, Ms. Stabenow, Mr. Sullivan, Aye. Mr. Tester, Mr. Thune, Aye. Mr. Tillis, Aye. Mr. Tuberville, Aye. Mr. Van Hollen, Aye. Mr. Vance, Aye. Mr. Warner, Aye. Mr. Warnock, no. Ms. Warren, no. Mr. Welch, no. Mr. Whitehouse, no. Mr. Wicker, Mr. Wyden, Mr. Young,
On, on this vote, the yeas are 49, the nays are 51. The motion is not agreed to. Madam President. The Republican leader is recognized. The Senate just swore an oath to do impartial justice according to the Constitution and the laws of our country. We swore to discharge a duty that is quite different from our normal work. As a court of impeachment, we're called not to speak, not to debate, but to listen, both to the case against the accused and to his defense. At this point, in any trial in the country, <clears throat> the prosecution presents the evidence of the case, counsel for the defense does the same, and the jury remains silent as it listens. This is what our rules require of us as well. But the Senate has not had the opportunity to perform this duty. The Senate will not hear the House managers present the details of their case against Secretary Mayorkas, that he willingly neglected the duties of his office and that he lied to Congress about the extent of that failure. Likewise, we will not hear the Secretary's representatives present the vigorous defense to which he is entitled. Our colleagues know that we are obligated to take these proceedings seriously. This is what our oath prescribes. It's what the history and precedent require. And I would urge each of our colleagues to consider that this is what the framers actually envisioned. The power of impeachment is one of the most delicate balances our constitutional system strikes with a portion of the American people's sovereign electoral authority. It purchases a safeguard against malpractice and it gives the Senate the power and the duty to decide. This process must not be abused. It must not be short-circuited. History will not judge this moment well. Therefore, I move to table the point of order and ask for the yeas and nays. Is there a sufficient second? There is. There is a sufficient second. The clerk will call the roll. Ms. Baldwin. No. Mr. Barrasso. Aye. Mr. Bennett. Mrs. Blackburn. Aye. Mr. Blumenthal. No. Mr. Booker. No. Mr. Bozeman. Yes. Mr. Braun. Aye. Mrs. Brett. Aye. Mr. Brown. No. Mr. Budd. Aye. Ms. Butler. No. Ms. Cantwell. No. Mrs. Capito. Aye. Mr. Cardin. Mr. Carper, Mr. Casey, Mr. Cassidy. Did he say? Did he say? Yeah, he did. Ms. Collins, Mr. Coons, Mr. Cornyn, Ms. Cortez Masto, Mr. Cotton, Mr. Kramer, Mr. Crapo. Mr. Cruz, Aye. Mr. Danes, Aye. Ms. Duckworth, no. Mr. Durbin, no. Ms. Ernst, Aye. Mr. Fetterman. No. Mrs. Fisher, Aye. Mrs. Gillibram, no. Mr. Graham, Aye. Mr. Grassley, Aye. Mr. Haggerty, Aye. Ms. Hassan, no. Mr. Hawley, Aye. Mr. Heinrich. Mr. Hickenlooper, Mr. Rono, Mr. Hoven, Mrs. Hyde Smith, Mr. Johnson, Mr. Kane, Mr. Kelly, Mr. Kennedy, Mr. King, Ms. Klobuchar, Mr. Lankford, Mr. Lee, Mr. Lujan. Ms. Lummis, Mr. Manchin, Mr. Markey, Mr. Marshall, Mr. McConnell, Mr. Menendez, 
Mr. Merkley. Mr. Moran. Aye. Mr. Mullen. Aye. Ms. Murkowski. No. Mr. Murphy. No. Mrs. Murray. No. Mr. Ossoff. No. Mr. Padilla. No. Mr. Paul. Aye. Mr. Peters. No. Mr. Reed. No. Mr. Ricketts. Aye. Mr. Risch. Aye. Mr. Romney. Aye. Ms. Rosen. No. Mr. Rounds. Aye. Mr. Rubio. Mr. Sanders, no. Mr. Schatz, no. Mr. Schmidt, Aye. Mr. Schumer. Mr. Scott of Florida, Mr. Scott of South Carolina, Aye. Mrs. Shaheen, no. Ms. Cinema, no. Ms. Smith, no. Ms. Stabenow, no. Mr. Sullivan, Mr. Tester, no. Mr. Thune, Mr. Tillis, Aye. Mr. Tuberville, Aye. Mr. Van Hollen, no. Mr. Vance, Aye. Mr. Warner, no. Mr. Warnock, no. Ms. Warren, no. Mr. Welch, no. Mr. Whitehouse, no. Mr. Wicker, Mr. Wyden, no. Mr. Young. Aye. The yeas are 49, the nays are 51. The motion to table is not agreed to. The motion before the Senate is the point of order. The question is on whether the point of order is well taken. Is there a sufficient, is there a sufficient second? There is. There is. Clerk will call the roll. Ms. Baldwin. Aye. Mr. Barrasso. No. Mr. Bennett. Mrs. Blackburn. Did she say no? Yes. Mr. Blumenthal. Aye. Mr. Booker. Aye. Mr. Bozeman. No. Mr. Braun. No. Mrs. Britt. No. Mr. Brown. Aye. Mr. Bud. Aye. Ms. Butler. Aye. Ms. Cantwell. Mrs. Capito, Mr. Cardin, Mr. Carper, Mr. Casey, Mr. Cassidy, Ms. Collins, Mr. Coons, Mr. Cornyn, Ms. Cortez Masto, Mr. Cotton, Mr. Kramer, Mr. Crapo, Mr. Cruz, no. Mr. Danes, no. Ms. Duckworth, Aye. Mr. Durbin, Aye. Ms. Ernst, no. 
Mr. Fetterman. Mrs. Fisher. Mrs. Gillibrand. Mr. Graham. Mr. Grassley. Mr. Haggerty. Ms. Hassan. Mr. Hawley. Mr. Heinrich. Mr. Hickenlooper. Ms. Hirono. Mr. Hoven. Mrs. Hyde Smith. Mr. Johnson. Mr. Kane. Mr. Kelly. Mr. Kennedy. Mr. King. Ms. Klobuchar. Mr. Lankford. Mr. Lee. Mr. Lujan. Ms. Lummis. Mr. Manchin. Mr. Markey. Mr. Marshall. Mr. McConnell. Mr. Menendez. Mr. Merkley. Mr. Moran. Mr. Mullen. Ms. Murkowski. Mr. Murphy. Mrs. Murray. Mr. Ossoff. Mr. Padilla. Mr. Paul. Mr. Peters. Mr. Reed. Mr. Ricketts. Mr. Risch. Mr. Romney. Okay. Ms. Rosen. Mr. Rounds. Mr. Rubio. Mr. Sanders. Mr. Schatz. Mr. Schmidt. Mr. Schumer. Mr. Scott of Florida. Mr. Scott of South Carolina. Mrs. Shaheen. Ms. Cinema. Ms. Smith. Ms. Stabenow. Mr. Sullivan. Mr. Tester. Mr. Thune. Mr. Tillis. Mr. Tuberville. Mr. Van Hollen. Mr. Vance. Mr. Warner. Mr. Warnock. Ms. Warren. Mr. Welch. Mr. Whitehouse. Mr. Wicker. Mr. Wyden. Mr. Young.
On this vote, the yeas are 51, the nays are 48. One senator responded present. The point of order is well taken and the article falls. Madam President. Majority Leader is recognized. I raise a point of order that impeachment article two does not allege conduct that rises to the level of a high crime or misdemeanor as required under article two, section four of the United States Constitution and is therefore unconstitutional. Madam President. Uh, under the precedents and practices of the Senate, the Chair has no power or authority to pass on such a point of order. The Chair, therefore, under the precedence of the Senate, submits the question to the Senate, is the point of order well taken? Senator from Utah. Senator from Utah is recognized. Madam President, as wrong as the Majority Leader was moments ago in making this particular point of order as to Article One of the impeachment articles, Article One, remember, uh, refers to the willful defiance uh, by Secretary Mayorkas of the law. As wrong as he was in making that as to Article I, and he was very wrong for the reasons articulated moments ago by the Senator from Texas, he is even more wrong, far more so, with respect to Article II, because Article II accuses him of knowingly making false statements. This is a violation of 18 U.S.C. Section 1001, a felony offense. If this is not a high crime and misdemeanor, what is? If this is not impeachable, what is? What precedent this, will be be set? We need to address to this and to discuss it. We need to discuss it in closed session. For that motion, reason, reason Madam order. President, I move that the Senate proceed to closed session to allow for deliberation on this very consequential point of order that he's just made that violates hundreds of years of Anglo-American legal the, precedent and understanding the, the on the question required by impeachment motion. rule 24. Question is, is an the, the question is on the motion. Is there sufficient second? There is. There is. Clerk will call the roll. Ms. Baldwin. Mr. Barrasso. Aye. Mr. Bennett. Mrs. Blackburn. Mr. Blumenthal, no. Mr. Booker, no. Mr. Bozeman, no. Mr. Braun, Aye. Mrs. Brett, Aye. Mr. Brown, no. Mr. Budd, Aye. Ms. Butler, no. Ms. Cantwell, no. Mrs. Capito. Yes. Mr. Cardin, no. Mr. Carper. Mr. Casey, Mr. Cassidy, Ms. Collins, okay, now I need to Mr. Coons, uh, four, six, one, nine. Mr. Cornyn, Ms. Cortez Masto, Mr. Cotton, Mr. Kramer, Mr. Crapo, Mr. Cruz. Mr. Daines, Ms. Duckworth, Mr. Durbin, Ms. Ernst, Mr. Fetterman, no. Mrs. Fisher, Mrs. Gillibrand, Mr. Graham, Mr. Grassley, Mr. Haggerty, Ms. Hassan, Mr. Hawley, Mr. Heinrich, Mr. Hickenlooper, Mr. Rono, no. Mr. Hoven, Mrs. Hyde Smith, no. Mr. Johnson, no. Mr. Kane, no. Mr. Kelly, no. Mr. Kennedy. I could not read that across the table before, I'm so sorry. Um, no. Can you tell me what it was? Mr. King, no. Ms. Klobuchar, no. Mr. Lankford, no. Mr. Lee, no. Mr. Lujan, no. Ms. Lummis. Mr. Manchin, no. Mr. Markey, no. Mr. Marshall, Aye. Mr. McConnell, Aye. Mr. Menendez, Mr. Merkley, Aye. Mr. Moran, right. okay. Mr. Mullen, right. Ms. Murkowski, Aye. Mr. Murphy, no. Mrs. Murray, no. Mr. Ossoff, Mr. Padilla, no. Mr. Paul, no. 
Mr. Peters? No. Mr. Reed? No. Mr. Ricketts? No. Mr. Risch? No. Mr. Romney? No. Ms. Rosen? Mr. Rounds? Mr. Rubio? Mr. Sanders? Mr. Schatz? Mr. Schmidt? Mr. Schumer, Mr. Scott of Florida, Scott of South Carolina, Mrs. Shaheen, Ms. Cinema, Ms. Smith, Ms. Stabenow, Mr. Sullivan, Mr. Tester, Mr. Thune, Mr. Tillis, Mr. Tuberville, Mr. Van Hollen, Mr. Vance. <coughs> Mr. Warner, no. Mr. Warnock, no. Ms. Warren, no. Mr. Welch, no. Mr. Whitehouse, no. Mr. Wicker, As Mr. Wyden, no. Mr. Young. On this vote, the nays are 49, the, ayes, uh, the yeas are 49, the nays are 51. The motion is not agreed to. The pending business is the point of order raised by the majority leader. Madam President. Senator from Florida. Madam President, as jurors, we have not had the time to review whether this point of order is contrary to the Constitution. Therefore, I move to adjourn the court of impeachment until 12 p.m. noon on Tuesday, April 30th, and ask for the yeas and nays. Is there a sufficient second? There is a sufficient second. The clerk will call the roll. Ms. Baldwin. Aye. Mr. Barrasso. Aye. Mr. Bennett. Aye. Mrs. Blackburn. Aye. Mr. Blumenthal. Aye. Mr. Booker. Aye. Mr. Bozeman. Aye. Mr. Braun. Aye. Mrs. Britt. Aye. Mr. Brown. Mr. Budd, Ms. Butler, Ms. Cantwell, Mrs. Capito, Mr. Cardin, Mr. Carper, Mr. Casey, Mr. Cassidy, Ms. Collins, Mr. Coons, Mr. Cornyn, Ms. Cortez Masto, Mr. Cotton, Mr. Kramer, Mr. Crapo, Mr. Cruz, Mr. Danes, Ms. Duckworth, Mr. Durbin, Ms. Ernst, Aye. 
Mr. Fetterman. Mrs. Fisher. Mrs. Gillibrand. Mr. Graham. Mr. Grassley. Mr. Haggerty. Ms. Hassan. Mr. Hawley. Mr. Heinrich. Mr. Hickenlooper. Ms. Hirono. Mr. Hoven. Mrs. Hyde Smith. Mr. Johnson. Mr. Kane. Mr. Kelly. Mr. Kennedy. Mr. King. Ms. Klobuchar. Mr. Lankford. Mr. Lee. Mr. Lujan. Ms. Lummis. Mr. Manchin. Mr. Markey. Mr. Marshall. Mr. McConnell. Mr. Menendez. Mr. Merkley. Mr. Moran. Mr. Mullen. Ms. Murkowski. Mr. Murphy. Mrs. Murray. Mr. Ossoff. Mr. Padilla. Mr. Paul. Mr. Peters. Mr. Reed. Mr. Ricketts. Mr. Risch. Mr. Romney. Ms. Rosen. Mr. Rounds. Mr. Rubio. Mr. Sanders. Mr. Schatz. Mr. Schmidt. Mr. Schumer. Mr. Scott of Florida. Aye. Mr. Scott of South Carolina. Aye. Mrs. Shaheen. No. Ms. Sinema. No. Ms. Smith. No. Ms. Stabenow. No. Mr. Sullivan. Aye. Mr. Tester. Aye. Mr. Thune. Aye. Mr. Tillis. Aye. Mr. Tuberville. Aye. Mr. Van Hollen. Aye. Mr. Vance. Mr. Warner. No. Mr. Warnock. No. Ms. Warren. No. Mr. Welch. No. Mr. Whitehouse. No. Mr. Wicker. No. Mr. Wyden. No. Mr. Young. No. 
On this vote, the yeas are 49, the nays are 51. The motion is not agreed. Madam President, a parliamentary inquiry. S Senator will state his parliamentary uh, inquiry. I appreciate that my friend from New York is eager to get this done with. But are we about to set a precedent that the allegation of a felony is not a high crime and misdemeanor? That is not an appropriate parliamentary inquiry. Uh, Madam President, I, I understand there are other ways for the majority to move this off the floor of the Senate, does but the, I would I would urge my colleagues the have a to understand to what we're doing. The question is on the point of order raised Madam by President, the majority leader, Madam President, the senator from Louisiana. Thank you, Madam President. I have a motion, and it takes precedence. As I appreciate motion. the majority leader's allegation, lying to the United States Congress is not a high crime and misdemeanor. You don't have to be Mensa material to know that it's the not Senator only a high motion. crime and misdemeanor, it is a felony. Would, would the Senator please state his motion? I will. Since we're not allowed to talk among ourselves about the absurdity of this, and my Democratic colleagues will not allow us to go into closed session to talk about the absurdity the of the, this. The Senate is I not move in a that we adjourn until 12 o'clock noon on May the 1st, 2004, and I ask for the yeas and nays. Is there a sufficient second? Would the senator modify his motion? I would ask the senator to modify his motion. Madam President, 2004 would probably be preferable. <laughs> but I'll accept a friendly amendment. We make it 2024. Here, here. The question is on the motion. Is there a sufficient second? There is. There is a sufficient second. The clerk will call the roll. Ms. Baldwin. Mr. Barrasso. Mr. Bennett. Yes. Mrs. Blackburn. Mr. Blumenthal. Mr. Booker. Mr. Bozeman. Mr. Braun. Mrs. Britt. Mr. Brown. Mr. Budd. Ms. Butler. Ms. Cantwell. Mrs. Capucho. Mr. Carden. Mr. Carper, Mr. Casey, Mr. Cassidy, Ms. Collins, Mr. Coons, Mr. Cornyn, Ms. Cortez Masto, Mr. Cotton, Mr. Kramer, Mr. Crapo, Mr. Cruz, Mr. Danes, Ms. Duckworth, Mr. Durbin, Ms. Ernst, Mr. Fetterman, Mrs. Fisher, Mrs. Gilliram, Mr. Graham, Mr. Grassley, Mr. Haggerty, Ms. Hassan, Mr. Hawley, Mr. Heinrich, Mr. Hickenlooper, Mr. Rono, Mr. Hoven. Mrs. Hyde Smith. Aye. Mr. Johnson. Aye. Mr. Kane. Aye. Mr. Kelly. Aye. Mr. Kennedy. Aye. Mr. King. Aye. Ms. Klobuchar. Aye. Mr. Lankford. Mr. Lee. Aye. Mr. Lujan. Aye. Ms. Lummis. Mr. Manchin, Mr. Markey, Mr. Marshall, Mr. McConnell, Mr. Menendez, Mr. Merkley, Mr. Moran, 
Mr. Mullen. Aye. Ms. Murkowski. No. Mr. Murphy. No. Mrs. Murray. No. Mr. Ossoff. No. Mr. Padilla. No. Mr. Paul. Aye. Mr. Peters. No. Mr. Reed. No. Mr. Ricketts. Aye. Mr. Risch. Mr. Romney, Ms. Rosen, Mr. Rounds, Mr. Rubio, Mr. Sanders, Mr. Schatz, Mr. Schmidt, Mr. Schumer, Mr. Scott of Florida, Mr. Scott of South Carolina, Mrs. Shaheen, Ms. Cinema, Ms. Smith, Ms. Stabenow. Mr. Sullivan, Mr. Tester, Mr. Thune, Mr. Tillis, Mr. Tuberville, Mr. Van Hollen, Mr. Vance, Mr. Warner, Mr. Warnock, Ms. Warren, Mr. Welch, Mr. Whitehouse, Mr. Wicker, Mr. Wyden, Mr. Young, Mr. 
On this vote, the yeas are 49, the nays are 51. The motion is not agreed to. The pending motion is the point of order uh, preferred by the uh, Senate Majority Leader. Madam President. Senator from, Senator from Kansas is recognized. Madam President, I have a motion and it takes precedent. Before this body disrespects the Constitution any further, before we endanger our republic any more, before we harm the reputation of this body any more, I move to adjourn until 7 a.m. on November 6, 2024, so the American people can at least have a vote on this impeachment trial. Yeah. Question is on the motion. Is there a sufficient second? Right. Just say the words. I ask you the name. Say the words. Is there a sufficient second? There is a sufficient second. Clerk will call the roll. Ms. Baldwin. No. Mr. Barrasso. Aye. Mr. Bennett. No. Mrs. Blackburn. No. Mr. Blumenthal. No. Mr. Booker. No. Mr. Bozeman. No. Mr. Braun. No. Mrs. Britt. No. Mr. Brown. No. Mr. Bud. Ms. Butler, Ms. Cantwell, Mrs. Capito, Mr. Cardin, Mr. Carper, Mr. Casey, Mr. Cassidy, Ms. Collins, Mr. Coons, Mr. Cornyn, Ms. Cortez Masto, Mr. Cotton, Mr. Kramer, Mr. Crapo, Mr. Cruz, Mr. Danes, Ms. Duckworth, Mr. Durbin, Ms. Ernst, Mr. Fetterman, Mrs. Fisher, Mrs. Gillibrand, Mr. Graham, Mr. Grassley, Mr. Haggerty, Ms. Hassan, Mr. Hawley, Mr. Heinrich, Mr. Hickenlooper, Ms. Hirono, Mr. Hoven, Mrs. Hyde Smith, Mr. Johnson, Mr. Kane, Mr. Kelly, Mr. Kennedy, Mr. King, Ms. Klobuchar, Mr. Lankford, Mr. Lee. Mr. Lujan, Ms. Lemus, Mr. Manchin, Mr. Markey, Mr. Marshall, Mr. McConnell, Mr. Menendez, Mr. Merkley, Mr. Moran, Mr. Mullen. Ms. Murkowski, Mr. Murphy, Mrs. Murray, Mr. Ossoff, Mr. Padilla, Mr. Paul, Mr. Peters, Mr. Reed, Mr. Ricketts, Mr. Risch, Mr. Romney, Ms. Rosen, Mr. Rounds, Mr. Rubio, Mr. Sanders, Mr. Schatz, Mr. Schmidt, Mr. Schumer, Mr. Scott of Florida, Mr. Scott of South Carolina, Mrs. Shaheen, Ms. Cinema, Mr. 
Ms. Smith. Ms. Stabenow. Mr. Sullivan. Mr. Tester. Mr. Thune. Mr. Tillis. Mr. Tuberville. Mr. Van Hollen. Mr. Vance. Mr. Warner. Mr. Warnock. Ms. Warren. Mr. Welch. Mr. Whitehouse. Mr. Wicker. Mr. Wyden. Mr. Young. On this vote, the yeas are 49, the nays are 51, the motion is not agreed. The pending motion is the point of order raised by the Majority Leader. Madam President. Senator from Alaska. Madam President, we seem to be in unprecedented territory here, so I have a parliamentary in inquiry. State your inquiry, please. Madam President, has there been a successfully invoked point of order to dispose of an article of impeachment prior to opening arguments by the House managers. The chair is not aware of any such occurrence. Thank you, Madam President. The pending, Unprecedented territory, pen, as I mentioned. Pending business is the point of order raised by the majority leader. Yeah, the yeas and nays. Madam President. Point of parliamentary inquiry. Madam President. The, the senator from Louisiana is seeking recognition. Will you state why you've asked for recognition, please? I'm sorry, I couldn't hear you, Madam President. Se senator from Louisiana is recognized. Thank you, Madam President. I have a motion, and it takes precedent. State your motion, please. Before we establish a precedent, that lying to the United States Congress is not a felony. The senator from Louisiana will state his motion. And before we add a new chapter to the movie Pulp Fiction, Please, I senator... move that we go into executive session to at least allow us to talk about the, the breathtaking precedent we're about to establish here. And I ask for the yeas and nays. The, the question is on the motion to proceed to executive session. The yeas and nays have been requested. Is there a sufficient second? There is. There is a sufficient second. The clerk will call the roll. Ms. Baldwin. No. Mr. Barrasso. From 1900? Mr. Bennett. Okay. Mrs. Blackburn. Mr. Blumenthal. Mr. Booker. Mr. Bozeman. Mr. Braun. Mrs. Britt. Mr. Brown. Mr. Budd. Ms. Butler. Ms. Cantwell. Mrs. Capito. Mr. Cardin. Mr. Carper. Mr. Casey. Mr. Cassidy. How much more of this do we do? Ms. Collins. Mr. Coons. Mr. Cornyn. Ms. Cortez Masto. Mr. Cotton. Mr. Kramer. Mr. Crapo. Mr. Cruz. Mr. Danes. Ms. Duckworth. Mr. Durbin. Ms. Ernst. Mr. Fetterman. Mrs. Fisher, Mrs. Gillibrand, Mr. Graham, Mr. Grassley, 
Mr. Haggerty. Aye. Ms. Hassan. No. Mr. Hawley. Aye. Mr. Heinrich. Mr. Hickenlooper. Not the 19th century. Mr. Rono. Mr. Hoven. Mrs. Hyde Smith. Mr. Johnson. Mr. Kane. Mr. Kelly. Mr. Kennedy. Mr. King. Ms. Klobuchar. Mr. Lankford. Mr. Lee. Mr. Lujan. Ms. Lummis. Mr. Manchin. Mr. Markey. Mr. Marshall, Mr. McConnell, Mr. Menendez, yes. Mr. Merkley, Mr. Moran, Mr. Mullen, Ms. Murkowski, Mr. Murphy, Mrs. Murray, Mr. Ossoff, Mr. Padilla, Mr. Paul, Mr. Peters, no. Mr. Reed, Mr. Ricketts, Aye. Mr. Risch, Aye. Mr. Romney, Aye. Ms. Rosen, Aye. Mr. Rounds, Aye. Mr. Rubio, Aye. Mr. Sanders, no. Mr. Schatz, no. Mr. Schmidt, Aye. Mr. Schumer, Aye. Mr. Scott of Florida, Aye. Mr. Scott of South Carolina, Aye. Mrs. Shaheen. No. Ms. Cinema. No. Ms. Smith. No. Ms. Stabenow. Here. Mr. Sullivan. No. Mr. Chester. No. Mr. Thune. No. Mr. Tillis. Okay. Mr. Tuberville. Okay. Mr. Van Hollen. No. Mr. Vance. Aye. Mr. Warner. No. Mr. Warnock. No. Ms. Warren. No. Mr. Welch. No. Mr. Whitehouse. No. Mr. Wicker. Yes. Mm -hmm. Mr. Wyden. Mm -hmm. Mr. Young. Mm -hmm. <laughs> On this vote, the yeas are 49, the nays are 51, the motion is not agreed to.
the pending amendment is the point of order. Pending motion is the point of order raised by the majority leader. Madam President. Uh, the senator recognizes the Republican whip. Madam President, I think it goes without saying that the Mayorkas, Biden policies have led to the worst border crisis in American history. 7.6 million people apprehended, 1.8 million gotaways. Who knows how the, many unknown gotaways? The senator gotaways. is reminded that, that we are in a non-debatable position in the Senate. The one thing we know is that 357 people were on the terrorist watch list apprehended coming into this country. We have a responsibility to hear these the, articles of impeachment. The Senate will be in order. And therefore, I move to table the Schumer point of order. And I ask for the A's and A's. Is there a sufficient second? There is, there is a sufficient second. Clerk will call the roll. Ms. Baldwin. Mr. Barrasso. Mr. Bennett. Mrs. Blackburn. Mr. Blumenthal. Mr. Booker. <laughs> Mr. Bozeman. Mr. Braun. Mrs. Britt. Mr. Brown. Mr. Budd. Ms. Butler. Ms. Cantwell. Mrs. Capito. Mr. Cardin. Mr. Carper. Mr. Casey. Mr. Cassidy. Ms. Collins. Mr. Coons. Mr. Cornyn. Ms. Cortez Masto. Mr. Cotton. Mr. Kramer. Mr. Crapo. Mr. Cruz. Mr. Danes. Ms. Duckworth. Mr. Durbin. Thank you. Ms. Ernst. Mr. Fetterman. Mrs. Fisher. Mrs. Gillibrand. Mr. Graham. Mr. Grassley. Mr. Haggerty. Ms. Hassan. Mr. Hawley. Mr. Heinrich. Mr. Hickenlooper. Ms. Serono. Mr. Hoven. Mrs. Hyde Smith. Mr. Johnson. Mr. Kane. Mr. Kelly. Mr. Kennedy. Mr. King. Ms. Klobuchar. Mr. Lankford. Mr. Lee. Mr. Lujan. Ms. Lummis. Mr. Manchin. Mr. Markey. Mr. Marshall. Mr. McConnell. Mr. Menendez. Mr. Merkley. Mr. Moran. Mr. Mullen. Ms. Murkowski. Mr. Murphy. Mrs. Murray. Mr. Ossoff. Mr. Padilla. Mr. Paul. Mr. Peters. Mr. Reed. Mr. Ricketts. Mr. Rich. Mr. Romney. Ms. Rosen. Mr. Rounds. Mr. Rubio. Mr. Sanders. Mr. Schatz. Mr. Schmidt. Mr. Schumer. Mr. Scott of Florida. Mr. Scott of South Carolina. Mrs. Shaheen. Ms. Cinema. Ms. Smith. Ms. Stabenow.
Mr. Sullivan. Mr. Tester. Mr. Thune. Mr. Tillis. Mr. Tuberville. Mr. Van Hollen. Mr. Vance. Mr. Warner. Mr. Warnock. Ms. Warren. Mr. Welch. Mr. Whitehouse. Mr. Wicker. Mr. Wyden. Mr. Young. Thank you. On this vote, the yeas are 49, the nays are 51. The motion is not agreed to. The pending the business is the point of inquiry. order uh, offered by the Senate Majority Leader. Madam, Madam President, parliamentary inquiry. S Senator will state his inquiry. Madam, Madam President, I inquire whether the actions we take to today are creating a precedent on impeachments that would apply to all future impeachment actions in the Senate, including a, an impeachment of the President of the United States. Impeach impeachment precedents uh, would, would apply in future um, impeachment hearings. The question is on the point of order. Is there a sufficient second? There is a sufficient second. The clerk will call the roll. Ms. Baldwin. Aye. Mr. Barrasso. No. Mr. Bennett. I know what it is. I Mrs. Blackburn. Uh, Mr. Blumenthal. Aye. Mr. Booker. Aye. Mr. Bozeman. No. Mr. Braun. No. Mrs. Britt. Mr. Brown. Mr. Budd, Ms. Butler, Aye. Ms. Cantwell, Aye. Mrs. Capucho, Aye. Mr. Carden, Aye. Mr. Carper, Aye. Mr. Casey, Aye. Mr. Cassidy, Aye. Ms. Collins, Aye. Mr. Coons, Aye. Mr. Cornyn. Aye. Ms. Cortez Masto, Aye. Mr. Cotton. Mr. Kramer, Mr. Crapo, Mr. Cruz, Mr. Danes, Ms. Duckworth, Mr. Durbin, Ms. Ernst, Mr. Fetterman, Mrs. Fisher, Mrs. Gillibrand, Mr. Graham, Mr. Grassley, oh, I know that. That's not Mr. Haggerty, Ms. Hassan, Mr. Hawley, Mr. Heinrich, Mr. Hickenlooper, Ms. Arono, Mr. Hoven, Mrs. Hyde Smith, Mr. Johnson, Mr. Kane, Mr. Kelly, Mr. Kennedy, Mr. King, Ms. Klobuchar, 
Mr. Lankford. No. Mr. Lee. Maybe not. Mr. Lujan. Ms. Lummis. No. Mr. Manchin. Of course I do. Mr. Markey. No. Mr. Marshall. No. Mr. McConnell. Mr. Menendez. Mr. Markley. Mr. Moran. Mr. Mullen. Ms. Murkowski. Mr. Murphy. Mrs. Murray. Mr. Ossoff. Mr. Padilla. Mr. Paul. Mr. Peters. Mr. Reed. Mr. Ricketts. Mr. Risch. Mr. Romney. Ms. Rosen. Mr. Rounds. Mr. Rubio. Mr. Sanders. Mr. Schatz. Mr. Schmidt. Mr. Schumer. Mr. Scott of Florida. Mr. Scott of South Carolina. Mrs. Shaheen. Ms. Cinema. Ms. Smith. Ms. Stabenow. Mr. Sullivan. Mr. Tester. Mr. Thune. Mr. Tillis. Mr. Tuberville. Mr. Van Hollen. Mr. Vance. Mr. Warner. Mr. Warnock. Ms. Warren. Mr. Welch. Mr. Whitehouse. Mr. Wicker. Mr. Wyden. Mr. Young. On this vote, Senate will be in order.
On this vote, the yeas are 51, the nays are 49. The point of order is well taken. Article, Article 2 falls. Madam President. Majority Leader is recognized. I move to adjourn the impeachment trial of Alejandro N. Mayorkas, sine die, and I ask for the yeas and nays. Is there a sufficient second? There is. There is a sufficient second. Clerk will call the roll. Ms. Baldwin. Aye. Mr. Barrasso. No. Mr. Bennett. Did he say aye? Mrs. Blackburn. Mr. Blumenthal. Mr. Booker. Mr. Bozeman. Mr. Braun. Mrs. Britt. Mr. Brown. Mr. Budd. Ms. Butler. Ms. Cantwell. Mrs. Capito, Mr. Cardin, Mr. Carper, Mr. Casey, Mr. Cassidy, Ms. Collins, Mr. Coons, Mr. Cornyn. Ms. Cortez Masto, Mr. Cotton, Mr. Kramer, Mr. Crapo, Mr. Cruz, Mr. Danes, Ms. Duckworth, Mr. Durbin, Ms. Ernst, Mr. Fetterman, Mrs. Fisher, Mrs. Gillibrand, Mr. Graham, Mr. Grassley, Mr. Haggerty, Ms. Hassan, Mr. Hawley, Mr. Heinrich, Mr. Hickenlooper, Ms. Hirono, Mr. Hoven, Mrs. Hyde Smith, Mr. Johnson, no. Mr. Kane, Mr. Kelly, Mr. Kennedy, no. Mr. King, Ms. Klobuchar, Mr. Lankford, Mr. Lee, Mr. Lujan, Mr. Lummis. Ms. Lummis, no. Mr. Manchin, Aye. Mr. Markey, Aye. Mr. Marshall, no. Mr. McConnell, Gary. Mr. <laughs> Mr. Menendez, Mr. Merkley, Mr. Moran, Mr. Mullen, Ms. Murkowski, Mr. Murphy, Mrs. Murray, Mr. Ossoff, Mr. Padilla, Mr. Paul, Mr. Peters, Mr. Reed, Mr. Ricketts, Mr. Rich, Mr. Romney, Ms. Rosen, Mr. Rounds, Mr. Rubio, Mr. Sanders, Mr. Schatz, Mr. Schmidt, Mr. Schumer, Mr. Scott of Florida, Mr. Scott of South Carolina, Mrs. Shaheen, Ms. Cinema, Ms. Smith, Ms. Stabenow, Mr. Sullivan, Mr. Tester, Mr. Thune,
Mr. Tillis. Mr. Tuberville. Mr. Van Hollen. Mr. Vance. Mr. Warner. Mr. Warnock. Ms. Warren. Mr. Welch. Mr. Whitehouse. Mr. Wicker. Mr. Wyden. Mr. Young.
On this vote, the yeas are 51, the nays are 49. The motion is to agree to. The Senate sitting as the Court of Impeachment stands adjourned sine die. Majority Leader is recognized. Uh, for the information of members, there are no further votes today. Now I remind all members that we have very serious business ahead of us um, in the next few days, and we'll keep you informed as to schedule as things can get scheduled. Republican Leader is recognized. The Senate will be in order. Would senators Madam, please take their conversations to the cloak? Madam room. President, we've set a very unfortunate precedent here. This means that the Senate can ignore, in effect, the House's impeachment. It doesn't make any difference whether our friends on the other side thought he should have been impeached or not. He was. And by doing what we just did, we have, in effect, ignored the directions of the House, which were to have a trial. We had no evidence, no procedure. This is a day that's not a proud day in the history of the Senate. She went. If you want to find her, that would be Madam President. Uh, Senator from Utah is recognized. Madam President, I ask unanimous consent to enter into a colloquy with my Republican colleagues. Without objection, so ordered. Madam President. <clears throat> Senator from Utah would hold. We do not have order in the Senate. I would ask all senators who are, to take their conversations to the cloakroom as well as the staff. The Senator would just hold till we have order, please. Senator from Utah is recognized. Thank you, Madam President. What we've witnessed today is truly historic. This has never occurred. Nothing like this has ever occurred. You know, under Article 1, Section 3, Clause 6, we've been given a duty. We've been given this, the sole exclusive power to try all impeachments. Try all impeachments. Not some of them, not just those with which we have happened to agree, not just those that we are happy that the House of Representatives undertook to prosecute, but all. The word try is also significant. It refers to the word trial. It's the same word. It's a proceeding in which the law and the facts are presented to finders of fact in front of judges in order to reach an ultimate disposition. In a criminal proceeding, it would be a, an ultimate disposition culminating in a verdict of guilty or not guilty. We were precluded from doing that job today, and we were precluded from doing so in a way that is not only ahistoric and unprecedented, but also counter-constitutional. Nothing could be further from the plain structure, text, and history of the Constitution than that. So let's look at the arguments that we would have heard, that we could have heard, that we should have heard today, had things unfolded as they were supposed to had things unfolded in a manner consistent with the oath that we took, first when we were sworn in as United States Senators, and we're, we're all required to take the same oath to the Constitution when we did that, but also the oath that we took just a few hours ago in this very chamber, in this very case, to decide this case impartially. What would we have heard? Well, first and foremost, regardless of what you think about what a trial consists of or how different people might cleverly define the term. A trial will always, at a minimum, involve lawyers. Involve lawyers. And unless the person is proceeding pro se, you will always have lawyers there. Or at least one side will always be represented by lawyers. And in 99.9% .9 of all cases, both sides will. You will hear from lawyers. We didn't hear that today. We didn't hear from the committee of individuals appointed by the House of Representatives to be the, the House impeachment managers or prosecutors. What else would you expect to hear? Well, you'd, you'd hear uh, evidence. Evidence would be brought in. Sometimes trials in the Senate involve bringing in evidence uh, in a documentary form. Other times you might have witnesses. We didn't have any witnesses. We didn't have any documentary evidence other than that which was charged. So let's talk about what was charged and what evidence we could have, would have, and should have heard had we done our job today. Well, the, the accusations 
in this impeachment trial can be fit into two categories. Category one is found in Article one of the Articles of Impeachment. Article one alleges that Secretary Mayorkas repeatedly, defiantly, did the exact opposite of what federal law requires. Namely, that under myriad circumstances, eight or nine different statutory provisions that he violated, he was required to detain people whom he did not detain. But it's not just that he didn't do what the law required. He did the exact opposite of that. Instead of holding them until such time as they could be removed or alternatively adjudicated to have the status, whether under uh, impeach, uh, w whether in the context of immigration parole or asylum or otherwise. He just released them. And in many cases, gave them work permits. We would have heard evidence about the fact that memoranda issued by Secretary Mayorkas within the Department of Homeland Security didn't just tolerate this result, they instructed this result. We would have heard evidence about the fact that at the outset of the Biden administration, Secretary Mayorkas, when asked what he would tell those traveling through the caravans, those paying many thousands of dollars per head, in some cases tens of thousands of dollars per head, to international drug cartels, Instead of telling them, don't do it, he said, maybe don't do it yet. Give us a few weeks before we're ready to receive you. Showing intention, a forethought, to facilitate the violation of federal law. We would have heard evidence about how he instructed his own department to violate those rules. We would have heard evidence about how directly contrary to federal law those things are, and contrary to his own oath, in his own duties. Now, as to Article I, the Senate chose to dispose of this today by doing something it's never done in any context anywhere close to this, with a point of order that said as follows. The majority leader stood up, defiantly refusing to have the Senate perform its obligations and raise the following point of order. He said, I raise a point of order that impeachment article one does not allege conduct that rises to the level of a high crime or misdemeanor as required under article two, section four of the United States Constitution is therefore unconstitutional. All right, let's, uh, let's talk about that for a minute. Now, had, had we been permitted to have a trial, alternatively, had we been permitted to go into executive session, alternatively, had we been permitted to go into closed session, as several of us moved today, we would have been able to hear arguments about this, about how wrong this is, because that's what you do when you have a trial. You hear evidence, you hear arguments from lawyers, and when someone makes a legal argument, as Majority Leader Schumer just did, you can consider their implications, and most importantly, consider whether or not the argument is right. Because when we're sworn in, in a trial of impeachment, our job is to serve as both finders of fact and adjudicators of law, relevant to this case. We were denied that opportunity. So uh, while we're exploring what we would have heard had we gone to trial, had we done our job, let's also explore what would have happened in a real trial had somebody made an actual motion and we've been permitted to do our job. Well, look, first and foremost, this is uh, uh, patently absurd to argue that a willful refusal to obey the law one has a sworn solemn obligation to perform is somehow not impeachable. We don't have to look too far in order to find support for the conclusion that this is an illegitimate, unwarranted, uh, unwarranted, unsubstantiated claim, one that's directly contrary to law. In fact, we don't have to look further than President Biden's own lawyer, the Solicitor General of the United States, who holds a, a special position within our federal government, performs functions that many people mistakenly uh, associate with the Attorney General, but it is, in fact, the Solicitor General who is the United States government's chief appellate advocate and chief advocate before all proceedings in the U.S. Supreme Court. There was an exchange in a case uh, argued last term in the Supreme Court of the United States called United States versus Texas. In that case, the Supreme Court 
uh, heard arguments from the state of Texas about whether or not this administration's approach toward these same provisions of law is acceptable, whether or not they could challenge them. Now, unfortunately, the Supreme Court uh, reached a, a conclusion, a conclusion with which I strongly disagree, and the Supreme Court concluded ultimately that the state of Texas lacks standing to challenge uh, uh, federal policy, federal policy along the lines of what we're discussing today, uh, uh, notwithstanding the fact that it's, it's conduct that inflicts substantial harm on the state of Texas and its residents. But the important part that we should have been able to argue here today is the exchange that occurred at oral argument between Justice Kavanaugh and Elizabeth Preliger, Solicitor General of the United States. In her capacity as Solicitor General, as the Biden administration's chief appellate advocate and chief advocate before the United States Supreme Court. Justice Kavanaugh asked her a number of questions at oral argument, and on page 50 of that argument transcript, some of that discussion ensues. Yes, the following. If a new administration comes in and says, we are not going to enforce environmental laws, we're not going to enforce labor laws, your position, I believe, is that no state and no individual and no business would have standing to challenge a decision to, as a blanket matter, not just enforce, uh, just not enforce those laws, correct? Is, here's what Solicitor General Prelagor says. Quote, that's correct under this court's precedent, but the framers intended political checks in that circumstance. You know, if, if an administration did something that extreme and said we're just not gonna enforce the law, at all, then the president would be held to account by the voters, and Congress has tools at its disposal as well. So, this argument continues. Continues on to the next page, in which Justice Kavanaugh says, what are the exact tools that Congress has to make sure that the laws are enforced? And then Solicitor General Preligar Answer. She says, well, I think Congress obviously has the power of the purse, and she goes on to explain how this is relevant, and then this goes on until we get to page 53, and then at page 53, Justice Kavanaugh jumps back in and says, I, I think your position is, instead of judicial review, Congress has to resort to shutting down the government or impeachment or dramatic steps of some sort or another. Solicitor General Preligar responds by saying, well, I think that if those dramatic steps would be warranted, it would be in the face of dramatic abdication of statutory responsibility by the executive. So she just acknowledged exactly what has happened here, and she acknowledged that is exactly the moment at which the impeachment power becomes very relevant. Lest there be any doubt on that, this stuff was settled not just in 1789, when we adopted the Constitution, and when the framers used the language that they did. But remember, the framers were not operating in a vacuum. They were not writing on a blank slate. They were incorporating legal terminology that had been in use for centuries. In fact, Justice Story, in his, his treatise on the Constitution, discusses this very kind of thing and explains in section 798 of his, uh, his famed treatise, written not so very long after the Constitution itself was written, that we got this stuff from England, that the, the British knew what impeachment meant, and they understood what would constitute a high crime or misdemeanor. In section 798, Justice Story acknowledges that there was precedent, there was an understanding at the time of the founding that recognized that you would have an impeachable offense if, among other things, a Lord Admiral will, would have neglected the safeguard of the sea. They didn't have a Homeland Security Secretary then, not in America, not in Britain, but this is really analogous. This is the exact same thing. Somebody who had a duty to do a certain thing under the law defiantly refused to do so. Those are arguments we could have and would have and should have heard today had we had an actual trial, had we been permitted even to go into executive session or even to go into closed session. Why closed session? We won't want to have to do it in closed second session. But you see, the standing rules of impeachment in this body preclude us from having this very kind of debate. So when Majority Leader Schumer made this argument to the great shock and surprise of all of us, we wanted to warn the body and have this debate. He wouldn't let us do that. The Democrats voted us down. So that's, 
That's, uh, that's, that's Article 1 in a nutshell. Article 2 of the Articles of Impeachment, what do those get to? Well, those are interesting because those deal with false statements, knowingly false statements repeatedly made by Secretary Alejandro Mayorkas to Congress. To Congress, as it's performing its oversight responsibilities, he lied to Congress according to the allegations of the Articles of Impeachment in Article 2. To my great shock, I didn't, look, he, he was dead wrong as to Article 1. But if he was dead wrong as to Article 1, he was deader than a doornail, whatever that means. <laughs> Ten times more dead as a doornail as to Article 2 than he was to Article 1. Why is that? Well, because they allege in Article 2 that Secretary Mayorkas knowingly made false statements. Knowingly making false statements is a, it's a felony offense. It's punishable as a crime, as a felony federal offense under, among other things, 18 U.S.C. Section 1001. It's really routinely charged, prosecuted, and is the basis for lots of convictions for a felony offense. You can go to prison for a very long period of time for that. Now, for Chuck Schumer to argue... Senator Yale, Yes. I just want to be able to be sure I understand, Senator. I thought I heard... Mike, microphone. I'm... I'm uh, I asked uh, Senator Lee if he would yield to a question. Uh, I thought I heard Senator Schumer argue today that lying to the United States Congress was not a high crime or misdemeanor and therefore could not be the basis for uh, an article of impeachment. Did, did, did I hear that correct? correctly? That is exactly what he said. That is exactly what he said when he made this motion, because he stood up and he said, I raise a, a point of order that impeachment Article 2 does not allege conduct that rises to the level of a high crime or misdemeanor. So even though lying to the United States Congress is a felony, under the precedent that the majority leader and our Democratic colleagues established, it's not a high crime or misdemeanor? Is that what we did? That is precisely what the precedent established today stands for. That is, we've effectively, by this vote that the Democrats forced through, not even allowing us to debate this, and this is why I raised a point of order, on, or this is why I, I made a motion that we go into closed session to discuss this, because we've now set a precedent that effectively, very arguably effectively, immunizes from impeachment, making a false statement to Congress. Can I, may I ask one more, um, yes. Senator? Yes, please. Well, I'm trying to follow the, the Senate Majority Leader's logic. What do you have to do to get impeached now? I mean, a felony is not sufficient. What's above a felony? Well, let's see. Obviously, uh, uh, spreading what they deem misinformation uh, on the Internet might be a felony. Uh, I, I, I suppose at some point... But, uh, but, it, but, it, but it takes, as I understand it, Senator, you're a legal scholar, it takes more than a felony now. A high crime or misdemeanor? Yeah, I mean... It takes more Who's than a high on crime first? Or What's on second? I, I don't understand any of this, and I'm very, very worried and would like your thoughts or, or others' thoughts about the precedent that our Democratic colleagues, in their haste to sweep this under the rug, may have established. Yep. Will the gentleman from Louisiana yield for an adjunct question With to pleasure. his question? With pleasure. So the law says that lying to Congress is a felony. Since we're no longer using impeachment as a means to address someone who's lying to Congress, how does Congress prosecute or address someone who deliberately lies to Congress now that the Senate has swept away through this presidential action today the opportunity to use impeachment for that purpose. Thank you. Yeah, and I'd love to respond to that point briefly, if I could. What we've done 
is to effectively immunize this against impeachability. Immunize making false statements. And, and going back to the original question, I don't know, maybe aggravated first degree murder with uh, heinous, atrocious, and cruel conduct as aggravators, maybe that's still a high crime or a misdemeanor. That, that, that remains to be seen. But keep in mind, <laughs> particularly with the, the, the fact that they already set aside Article I and they've already said that that's out of bounds as well for impeachability, the Supreme Court has said pretty much nobody has standing to address that. What are we left with? And uh, getting, getting back to the, uh, to the question from Senator Lummis, this is a phenomenally dangerous precedent to have set here, specifically with regard to the false statements. Because what does that do to our oversight hearings, where we, we rely routinely on testimony provided under oath by cabinet secretaries and other administration officials? What does that do? What incentive structure does that create? What perverse incentives does that create for them to lie? Uh, with the Senator Gill? Yes. Uh, are you aware, here's a question, are you aware of the fact that President Clinton was impeached? And one of the charges against him was lying under oath in a civil lawsuit. Are you aware of that? Yes. Okay, so you can be impeached for lying under oath in a civil lawsuit, but apparently you can't be impeached for lying to Congress about how you do your job. So here's what I, I'll give Senator Schumer the benefit of the doubt, Senator Kennedy. He's saying that the fact pattern here apparently doesn't rise to the level of high crime or misdemeanor, that, that we don't have a situation, it's a policy disagreement. We've taken a policy disagreement in the House and tried to turn it into impeachment. Well, here's a question for you, uh, Senator Lee. Are you aware of the fact that two days ago, two days ago, uh, Secretary Mayorkas was asked about the parole of the man alleged to kill, to have killed Lake and Riley, Mr. Ibera. Why was he paroled and how, how he was paroled? Under the parole statute, 212 D5, there's two ways parole can be granted. Unique humanitarian need, circumstance. Your mother's dying. Something's going on bad. You need to get into the country on a temporary basis or special benefit to the United States. That means you're a witness in a probably cartel trial. <clears throat> Those are the only two reasons you can be paroled. And two days ago, no, yesterday, Secretary Marca said he did not know why Mr. Barra was paroled. Which one of the two was it? This was a question from Congressman Bishop. He said, I didn't know. At the same time he said, I didn't know, I had the file, and it says, subject was paroled due to detention capacity at the Central Processing Center in El Paso, Texas. In the file, he was paroled because they didn't have any space for him. Senator Schumer, this is illegal. The Secretary of Homeland Security cannot just add a condition to a statute. The statute doesn't allow you to give parole because you're full. And the reason this man was given parole is not because of the statutory requirements, because we'd run out of space, because we got more illegal immigrants than we can handle, and the rest is history. He gets paroled, he goes to New York, he gets convicted of a crime, he goes to Georgia and he's accused of murdering this lady. Seems to me that would be something we should argue over as to whether or not you should lose your job. Because you've got a statutory requirement limiting your authority to parole people. And in your own file, Exhibit A, you paroled him because the place was full. This happened two days ago. So... This gives kangaroo courts a bad name. This is a friggin' joke. We have a nation under siege. 1.9 million people have been paroled. Are you telling me they do an individual analysis on all the people? In February 2023, no, November 2023, I asked him, Secretary Marcus, 
Do you do a case-by-case -case analysis? Senator, we comply with the law. So you're telling me of all the 240,000, the ones in front of us, you determine they meet the criteria of urgent humanitarian need or significant public benefit? And he said, yes. This was in November under oath to me when I questioned, I don't believe you. I don't believe you're doing an individual analysis on this stuff. You're doing blanket parole and you're paper whipping this stuff. It turns out he gave false testimony to the Congress. Whether he lied or he's just doesn't know what he's doing, I don't know. You should be impeached either way. If you don't know what you're doing, you should be kicked out because you don't know what you're doing. But the man that we're talking about is the one charged with murdering this young lady who is going on a jog. If that's not important to the American people to find out how that happened and should somebody be held responsible, what the hell is? You can talk about why we impeached Trump and Clinton. Was it worthwhile? Did it matter? Was it all political? You cannot say this is not important. To say that how we're doing, he's doing his job, is not important to the American people. Tell that to the Riley family. This is not an academic debate. The policies of this administration being carried out by Secretary Mayorkas are illegal. The man charged with killing Lake and Riley was illegally released into this country by DHS. That should be something we argue about in the Senate as to whether or not you keep your job. It's been swept under the rug. There will be an election in November. This is the only chance you have to get this right to the American people. We had a chance today to hold somebody accountable, finally, for all the rape and the murder and the drugs. The largest loss of life in America is fentanyl coming through the border for young people. How many more people have to be died, die, rape, or murdered before somebody is held accountable? We had a chance here, and our Democratic friends swept it under the rug because they're more concerned about the November election than protecting the American people. And this is a sad day for the Senate. Law train kangaroos everywhere what are I said. going That's to be question. offended. Uh, by the use of the term kangaroo court. In fact, the entire marsupial world will be offended by this. <laughs> Senator Marshall, you have a question? Yield. Yes. It certainly seems to me that today, 51 of our friends across the aisle voted to not have a trial. Make note of this, that every person voted in that trial was a vote for an open border. It was a vote to tell Lake and Riley's family that the life of their daughter didn't matter. It was a vote to tell the 250,000 families that lost a loved one to fentanyl, it doesn't matter. But what struck me as the clock struck midnight here and we lost that vote, I feel like the Senate was gutted, that we lost part of our powers. You know, in high school, we were taught, high school government, we were talked about checks and balances. And one of the checks and balances that that the legislative branch had on the, on the executive branch was this impeachment process. And I want to ask my, my colleague from Texas, why do I feel like I've just been gutted right now, like the entire Senate, that this body has been gutted of, of a power that, that we're never going to get back, that, that impeachment going forward may, may mean nothing. Am I wrong? I'm sorry to say that my friend from Kansas is not wrong. In the 237 years of our nation's history, I don't know that there has been a more shameful day in the United States Senate than today. What we just witnessed was a travesty. It was a travesty to the United States Constitution, and it was a travesty to the American people. And it's important to understand why the Democrats did what they did. We're here on the Senate floor right now, but I want the record to reflect. I'm going to do a very accurate count of the number of Democrats who are with, with us. That would be zero, other than the presiding officer, and somebody has to preside. Not a single Democrat senator chose to come to this floor and listen to one word of evidence. 
when it comes to the Constitution. The Democrats concluded that Joe Biden and Alejandro Mayorkas defying federal law, ignoring the text of the statute, deliberately releasing criminal illegal aliens over and over and over again, that's just hunky-dory. You can't impeach him for that. Every Democrat just voted. By the way, every cabinet member, guess what? You've just been given a blank slate. Ignore the law. When Democrats are in charge of the Senate, the entire cabinet could ignore the law. It is no longer impeachable. In Democrat wonderland, when a member of the executive branch openly defies the law. By the way, every Democrat just voted that way. They didn't hear one word of argument. The majority leader didn't stand up and say, here's the reason why it's okay. No, he didn't present that argument. They didn't read a brief. Nobody wrote a brief. They didn't care enough to know what Senator Lee just laid out, that the Biden Department of Justice went in front of the U.S. Supreme Court and said if the executive defies the law, the answer is impeachment. The willingness of every Democrat to be blatantly hypocritical. Just last year, the Biden Justice Department said, no, 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 you can't sue in court. When we, the Biden administration, defy the law, the answer is impeachment. And like three-card money, every Senate Democrat said, no, 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 the answer is not impeachment. I don't know what it is. Actually, I do know what it is. There's only one answer left which is everyone who is unhappy about the open border shows up in November and to use the phrase, throw the bums out. Because if you're not willing to do your job, is there not one senator on that side of the aisle who cares enough to honor the Constitution? By the way, the second article they threw out said lying to Congress is not a high crime or misdemeanor, it's not impeachable. Now, as the senator from South Carolina pointed out, Bill Clinton was impeached for lying under oath. And you know what happened? That he was ultimately acquitted? But after a full trial where they heard the evidence, where the Senate did its job, by the way, one of the impeachment managers was Senator Graham, who presented that evidence right here on this floor. And you know what? Before Bill Clinton, there's a guy named Walter Nixon. You may not know who Walter Nixon is. Walter Nixon was a federal judge who was convicted of perjury. He was from Mississippi. He was convicted of perjury in front of a grand jury. And he was impeached. And it went to the Senate. And the Senate convicted him and removed him from the bench. So you want to know what the precedents were prior to today. You commit a crime, lying under oath, perjury. It is a high crime or misdemeanor that is impeachable. No more. Because understand the Democrats' rule here. This is all about, this is not about the Constitution. None of them care. By the way, we repeatedly moved. Let's go into debate. Hear the other side of the argument. Nope. Look, the famous three monkeys, hear no evil, see no evil, speak no evil. That's just evil, what they did. They don't want to know because they don't care. Because it's not about the Constitution. It's not about the law. It is about political expediency. But every bit as violent as what they did to the Constitution was... It's even more offensive what they did to the American people. Last year, 853 migrants died crossing illegally into this country. That's almost three a day. You go down to the southern border, you go down to Texas, which the Democrats don't bother to do because they don't care about the people dying. And you see photograph after photograph that Texas farmers and ranchers are finding of dead bodies on their property. Many of my colleagues here have been down there with me have seen the elderly people the human traffickers have abandoned, have seen the pregnant women the human traffickers have abandoned, have seen the infants and toddlers left to die. The Senate Democrats just told the American people they don't give a damn about the bodies and the people who have died the last three and a half years, and they don't give a damn about the people that are going to die next week. Next week... More migrants are going to die. When we brought 19 senators down to the border, we went out on a boat in the Rio Grande. We saw a man floating dead in the water. Senator Lee was there. Senator Kennedy was there. He had died that day. 
The Democrats just told the American people they don't care. When you go down to the border and you look at the children who've been brutalized, just about all of us here are parents. I will tell you, when you look in the eyes of a little girl or a little boy who's been abused by traffickers, and you see it, you see the pain, you see the agony of children trapped in sex trafficking, the Democrats just said they don't care. They won't hear the evidence, they don't care that it's deliberate, and they don't care that it'll happen next week, that it'll happen tomorrow. Tomorrow there will be children brutalized because of the Democrats' open border policies, and not a one of them cares. They don't care about the women who are repeatedly sexually assaulted. Again, when you look in the eyes of these women coming over, it's heartbreaking. And the Democrats just said, we don't care. And they don't care about the more than 100,000 Americans that died last year from drug overdoses. The highest in our nation's history. 70% of that is from Chinese fentanyl coming across our southern border. And the Democrats said, we don't want to hear about it. We're not interested in the Americans dying. You know what they also don't care about? They don't care about the criminals that are being released day after day after day. The Biden administration is releasing murderers and rapists and child molesters, and every week we see another story of somebody being killed, somebody being raped, another child being assaulted by illegal immigrants released by Alejandro Mayorkas and Joe Biden. How shocking is it that there wasn't one Democrat who says, you know, massive human suffering matters. We ought to hear the evidence. How shocking is it that there wasn't one Democrat? One! There are 51 of them on that side. Not a single one could screw up the courage to say, let's do our job, let's hear the evidence. How shocking is it that not a Democrat cares about the, temp about the terrorists who are streaming across our southern border? The nation of Iran has called for jihad against America. Hamas has called for jihad against America. Hezbollah has called for jihad against America. And Joe Biden and the Democrats have put out a red carpet and said, if you want to murder Americans, come across our southern border, and we, the Democrats, will welcome you. Like many of us on this floor, I was in Washington, D.C. on September 11, 2001. I remember the horror. I lost a good friend. Barbara Olson, who was in the plane that crashed into the Pentagon, I remember the smell of smoke and sulfur and burning. I remember the agony. And I remember the national uni unity that came after 9-11. As Democrats and Republicans came together, I don't know that I've ever been more proud of a president than when President George W. Bush stood on a pile of rubble with a bullhorn talking to firefighters and New Yorkers, and one of, the, one of the men in the crowd called out and said, we can't hear you, and he responded, well, I can hear you, and soon the whole world is going to hear you as well. We were as one. Today, not a single Democrat was able to mount up the courage to tell the majority leader, you know what, I don't want another 9-11 to happen. The House impeached Alejandro Mayorkas for, among other things, releasing terrorist after terrorist after terrorist. We ought to hear the evidence. I believe today we have a greater risk of a major terrorist attack on U.S. soil than at any point since September 11th. And every Democrat just told the American people it doesn't matter to them to hear the evidence. I appreciate my Republican colleagues who are here, who are willing to hear the evidence, willing to engage, willing to stand up and defend the American people. But you know what? The Democrats who aren't here, they aren't here because you know who's also not here? If you look up at the gallery, the reporters are all gone. A couple of folks in the back, I hope you're all right. But the reporters are absent. That's the Democrats' plan. 
What is fascinating, we're presenting arguments. Many of us, particularly those of us in judiciary, but many of us have presented those arguments over and over and over again in hearings. Not a Democrat argues on the other side. It's an issue unlike any other issue I know of in politics. Listen, if we're arguing about taxes, as Republicans, we say we should cut taxes. It's good for the American people. And you know what Democrats do? They stand up. We know they're talking points. No, no, no. Tax the rich. Okay, fine. We have a debate. We're talking about just about every issue. The Democrats will argue on the other side. They have their spin. What is fascinating? Where's Dick Durbin, chairman of the Judiciary Committee, standing up saying, no, no, it's not right that migrants are dying every day. No, it's not right that children are being assaulted every day. No, it's not right that women are being sexually assaulted every day. No, it's not right that they're releasing terrorists every day. They're not there. Not a Democrat is there. Why? Because you cannot defend it. I'll tell you, South Texas for 100 plus years has been a Democrat region of our state. It is turning re red with the speed of a freight locomotive because nobody can see the suffering that is unfolding and defend it. And the Democrats, by their silence and by the complicity of the press corps, they are counting on the press corps to write story. Victory for the Democrats, yay! They got rid of the impeachment trial. That's the headline they want. Understand they don't have a substantive defense. None of them disputes a word we are saying. Not a single Democrat has stood up and said, you know, it's wrong that Lake and Riley would still be alive if Joe Biden hadn't let her murderer go. They know it's right. The reason they didn't want a trial is they don't want the American people to hear about it. And it's our obligation to make sure the American people do. Senator Ricketts, is the former governor of Nebraska, I'd love to get your perspective on this. Thank you very much. Uh, appreciate the colleague from Utah organizing this. My, 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 what have our majority leader and the Democrats in the Senate wrought? They have overturned 227 years of precedents that my colleagues have talked about. 21 previous impeachments, all scheduled for trial. 17 came to trial, and the ones that did not because the person who was to be impeached was either expelled or dismissed prior to the trial. To my colleague from Texas's point about the media being complicit, one of the headlines in Politico that I was told about said the trial lasted only three hours. There was no trial. There was no trial. The majority leader decided that he could determine what was unconstitutional and get every single one of his Democrats along partisan lines to vote for it. Said it was unconstitutional. Did not rise to the level of high crimes and misdemeanors. Let me briefly examine that. Article 1, sent over to us by the House. I'm just going to read the title. Willful and systematic, or system, uh, systematic refusal to comply with the law. That's Article 1. Let me tell you about complying with the law. Prior to this administration, the Trump administration had brought illegal crossings down to a 45-year low. What we have seen since then is an explosion of illegal crossings. Over 1.7 in the first year of the Biden administration, nearly 2.4 in the second, nearly 2.5 in the third. Now, if you count all the people who have tried to cross the border illegal or have crossed the border, including the Godaways, it's 9.4 million people, larger than the population of New York City. 300,000 in just December alone. That is larger than our capital city, Nebraska-Lincoln. The evidence is right there that we're not doing a good job at the southern border. And why would that be? Well, because Alejandro Mayorkas is complicit in not following the law. In a memorandum Mayorkas sent to Immigration and Customs Enforcement officials in 2021, he said, and I'm going to quote here, 
The fact an individual is a removable non-citizen, notice he doesn't even say illegal alien, which is what it says in the law. He says the fact that an individual is a removable non-citizen, therefore, should not alone be the basis for an enforcement action against them. Basically saying, just because you broke the law doesn't mean we have to enforce the law. That right there should tell you he is willfully disregarding the law. Absolutely. Or how about the case of parole? Where the law says that it's only supposed to be used on a case-by-case -case basis. In situations where the person has an extreme humanitarian need or it's in the best interest of our country. Under the Biden or under the Obama and the Trump administrations, it was used an average of 5,600 times, paroled 5,600 foreigners in this country between the Obama and Trump administrations on an annual basis. Last year alone, Mayorkas paroled into this country 1.2 million for whole classes of people. A clear abuse of the law. Folks, when you see instances where the Secretary for Homeland Security is not following the law, doesn't that raise the question, shouldn't we have a trial? Shouldn't we examine whether or not he actually should be convicted of this? And yet, as my colleagues have pointed out, not a single Democrat, partisan line, said no, that is not willful disregard of the law. Let's move on to Article 2. Article 2, again, I'm just going to read the title of this, sent over, says, breach of public trust. Breach of public trust. Well, what does that mean? How about misleading Congress? Wouldn't that be a breach of public trust? On April 28, 2022, Mayorkas testified repeatedly in front of the House Judiciary Committee that DHS possessed the operational control of the southwest border, including in accordance with statutory definition. But I just told you how the number of people crossing the border had exploded. My colleague from Texas did a great job of talking about the human suffering this created. If we had been allowed to have a trial, we would have heard from Border Patrol agents who would have come up and testified personally that the border was not secure. I have been down to that border as well, four times. I've seen the people coming across. That border is not secure. In the last trip down there, it was mostly Hondurans, but it was a couple from Moldova on the Russian border that had paid to get across to our border because the whole world knows it's open. This is absolutely what we are talking about, that this is why we have to hear the evidence to go and determine whether or not there is guilt or innocence, and the Democrats have denied it, and it is to the detriment of our Constitution and our country that we are not being allowed to have a trial to examine the evidence and determine whether or not Alejandro Mayorkas is guilty and whether or not he should be impeached. I think the few things I have laid out here this afternoon go exactly to we should examine the questions. And the Democrats chose not to even ask the questions before they dismissed this entirely. Thank you. Um, to my colleague from Utah for giving me the opportunity to be able to address these issues. Thank you. <clears throat> Before he had his, his name changed legally uh, for purposes of this chamber uh, uh, to the uh, junior senator from Missouri, uh, Attorney General Eric Schmidt uh, was one of the um, uh, nation's leading legal minds engaged in this problem, engaged in trying to address the lawlessness at our southern border brought on by the policies of this administration. I'd love to hear his perspective on what happened today. Thank you, Senator. Um, yeah, I think this in two parts. I think it is important for us to actually digest, and for the folks here watching or in the gallery or the press folks who are here who have left, to really understand what happened today. Because what happened today wasn't some disagreement about the number of amendments we might have on an appropriation bill or whether or not some vehicle is going to be a priority or not. What was established today was a new precedent, something that had never taken place in this chamber in the history of our republic.
What the Senate Democrats decided to do with a simple majority was to bulldoze 200 years of precedent that said something very simple, that this chamber would honor our constitutional obligation and conduct a trial to hear the evidence. There's no real debate. We were to hear the evidence from witnesses, counsel is present. There's a whole process, there's a whole procedure that's been established, finally wrought throughout the ages that we were to honor, when we raise our right hand, when we get sworn in, to honor, when we got sworn in today, to honor, as United States Senators. That's all gone now. Maybe forever. I don't see a circumstance now, you heard the parliamentary inquiries asking if a precedent had ever been established for this or that. A hundred years from now, when somebody else has Harry Truman's desk, if I remember to carve my name in it before I die, we'll have this desk. I don't know that person's name. I don't know their background or what their life experience will be. But what they'll know what happened today. They'll know that the, that the United States Senate under Chuck Schumer, who will go down as one of the worst US senators in American history because of his actions today, will know that we just blew off an important duty conduct a trial. It wasn't, you know, an idea, and to paraphrase my friend from Louisiana, it wasn't some, you know, gamer bro with a tweet. These were articles of impeachment voted on by the people's representative, representatives in the House of Representatives walked over here and delivered. And so Chuck Schumer and the Democrats who voted for that, they're going to have to own that. And to paraphrase um, something the, the senator from Kentucky said just a few years ago, I think they're going to regret it. And I think they're going to regret it sooner than they think. So having said that, what was this trial supposed to be about? And as senator, the senator from Utah mentioned, when I was attorney general in Missouri, we brought the first lawsuit against the Biden administration for um, their actions at the southern border when they decided to undo Remain in Mexico. We were successful for a while. But what came out of that um, was a lot of what you might have read in, the, in, in Article 1 um, of the impeachment that were brought over. A lot of those were from, um, a lot of those uh, arguments were from that case. Um, and as an interesting little side note, when we won, when we had an injunction in place actually for the Biden administration to keep this very important protection in place, they ignored it. We had to go back in front of a judge time and time again to get them to uh, abide by the law. But what we have found out from this administration and Secretary Mayorkas specifically is they is willing, he himself is willing to subvert the law, to believe that he is above the law to lie and to commit a felony that this chamber now has said doesn't rise to the level of a high crime and misdemeanor forever. That is the precedent forever. So the human toll of this lawlessness at the border that has been overseen by Secretary Mayorkas is devastating. Thousands of people die every month for fentanyl abuses or overdoses. We have a ticking time bomb in this country with a national security threat. We don't know who two million people are. Nine million people have come here illegally. Most of them have been told, have been told please show up for a court date sometime in the 2030s. That's not going to happen. But two million of them, we don't know who they are. We don't know where they're from. We don't know where they're at. We're seeing a record number of Chinese nationals come across just in California alone. People from all across the world coming here because they know our border is wide open and it's not by accident. And whatever the motivations are, Secretary Mayorkas' memo and instruction to his employees to ignore the law the, the immigration law in this country, the, the, the snapshot is, if somebody comes here illegally, they're detained, they're deported, 
unless some adjudication exists, like asylum claim is processed. Nine out of 10 of those are bogus. That had been the law of our country, the law of the land for a very long time among Republican and Democrat administrations, no longer. Because Secretary Mayork has decided to, to instruct his employees to subvert that law. If you want to change it, come here. If you want to change a shall to a may, that's what we're supposed to do. That's what the Article I branch is supposed to do. Just like the Article I branch here in the Senate is supposed to hold people accountable who are in high positions of government. It is our remedy. And as the back and forth in that United States versus Texas and Missouri case from, from Justice Kavanaugh to the Solicitor General of the United States indicated, what is the remedy here? And the Department of Justice own lawyer said, well, they have the remedy of impeachment, but I guess we don't actually have that anymore. And so I know that in these 24-hour 24 24 news cycles, things move on quickly. Tomorrow we're going to be on you know, FISA, there's national security stuff, and it'll be easy to sort of, I think, for many, to sort of wipe today away, but it won't go away. It's a stain on this institution. It diminishes this body. It is why I stood up to object to a ridiculous idea that somehow we're supposed to negotiate away our constitutional duty. That isn't up for grabs. That's our job. Oh, thank you, Senator Schumer, for giving us a half hour to talk about this. No thanks. Not for me. Now, would I do that on some amendment to an approach bill? Probably not. But when Senator Schumer wants to set our constitutional order on fire, I will stand up and I will object. And I know many other people share that point of view. There is no structure to the arson you're committing. So I appreciate the inquiry or the, this back and forth we're having with the senator from Utah because sadly, this is all we're left with. So many powers of individual senators have been given away over the years. This institution is no longer the world's greatest deliberative body. It's kabuki theater with fewer powers now individual senators have and fewer powers that we've been given by our founders as an institution. For what? For what? A couple of bad days, a couple of news cycles? Congratulations. Con congratulations, Chuck Schumer. You're gonna own that. And every single Democrat that voted for it will too. So the border crisis isn't going away. It still exists. The Senate lost an opportunity here to hear evidence to hold someone accountable today. Thank you, Senator. Thank you. Uh, excellent remarks. There are some days that one wishes one could live over. This is a day that will live in infamy and a day that uh, future generations will wish had gone differently. We've got a friend and colleague. Our friend and colleague, the senior senator from Wisconsin, has many titles in the Senate, titles of distinction. He is the prince of plastics, the maven of manufacturing, the connoisseur of cheese curds. Uh, he is also, uh, among other things, someone who's identified himself as uh, the chancellor of charts, showing the profound depth of our border security crisis. He's been working on this ever since he first became the chairman of the Homeland Security Committee back in 2015. He's built on these charts, and he's built on them in a way that has resulted in them catching fire. You'll now see uh, politicians all over the country at every level of government, and I mean every level of government, utilizing his charts because they're best, the best in the business. Let's hear from him now. Well, I thank my colleague from Utah. I was not aware of all those titles, but I'll, I'll accept them. Uh, if we would have had a trial, and it's a travesty, we haven't. I mean, there's, done, there's been great damage done 
our Constitution, to this institution by our colleagues on the other side of the aisle because they didn't want the American people to see this. Now, I've described this chart. Had we had a trial, this would have been the irrefutable DNA evidence that proved the crime. There's no way you can take a look at the history of illegal entry in this country and not recognize what has happened, what has happened under the Biden administration, under Secretary Mayorkas, is nothing less than an utter catastrophe. Yesterday, I spent about 10, 15 minutes on the floor going through the history, the, the cause and effect that this chart shows. But what I really want to point out today is what the Democrats did not want us to reveal. Because what this chart shows is that this was purposeful. This was willful. President Biden, Secretary Morcus, our Democrat colleagues here in, in Congress, in the Senate, they want an open border. They caused this crisis. This didn't just happen. This was a game plan that they implemented. They aided and abetted all the damage, all the destruction, all the crimes that result of this. They have aided and abetted it. What this chart does show is that the lawlessness started back in 2012 under the Obama administration under the Deferred Action for Childhood Arrivals. This took prosecutorial discretion which is, again, I'm not a lawyer, I'm not a prosecutor, but I believe that's supposed to be applied on a case-by-case -case basis. President Obama took prosecutorial discretion and granted it to hundreds of thousands of people. That is what has sparked every surge in illegal immigration since that point in time. I used to have a chart that just showed unaccompanied children. And prior to the DACA, it was maybe two, three, four thousand uncompanied children per year that our federal government had to account for and had to deal with. In 2014, because of DACA, we encountered 69,000 uncompanied children. 69,000. And even back then, President Obama. When his Department of Homeland Security, his Customs and Border Patrol, were dealing with 2,200 illegal immigrants being encountered per day, he declared that a humanitarian crisis. 2,200 people a day. And by the way, I went down to McAllen, Texas, with a bunch of Democrat colleagues in February 2015 during this surge. And people were singing the praises of CBP, of kind of skirting bureaucratic rules and setting up a detention facility. They would protect children. They used chain link fences. Again, we were singing their praises. Democrats were singing the praises of CBP. A few years later, when President Trump had to deal with the crisis, again, sparked by the unlawful DACA memorandum, all of a sudden, Democrats were saying it was kids in cages. Do you notice the double standard? I won't go through all the history, but I will point out President Trump, because the reality of the situation was we were letting children in, we couldn't detain them. You had the Florida reinterpretation that said that children, even accompanied by their parents, couldn't be detained. People around the world noticed that, so they started coming. They started creating fake families. Children are being sold, in testimony for my committee, children are being sold for $81 to create a family. A little boy was found abandoned in a field of 100 degrees temperatures. He'd already been used. He created that family. The other people got in, and they just left him there. The only identification was a phone number written on his shoe. President Obama, Secretary Mayorkas, said they had to undo all of President Trump's successful border security provisions because they said those were inhumane. There's nothing humane about facilitating the multi-billion dollar business model of some of the most evil people on the planet.
the human traffickers, the sex traffickers, the drug traffickers. How many overdose deaths have we experienced throughout America because of this open border policy? There's nothing humane about that. But when President Trump faced his speak, is a, is a sharp, sharp rise, but a sharp fall. In May of 2019, almost 4,800 people entered this country illegally. But President Trump did something about it. He used what the Supreme Court said in the 2018 decision, our existing law, that exuded deference to the president. So even though that presidential authority had been weakened somewhat by the Flores reinterpretation of that settlement, even with that weakened authority, President Trump took the bull by the horns, instituted a remain in Mexico, safe third world countries, had to threaten the president of Mexico with, with tariffs so he would cooperate. But in 12 months, President Trump went from his peak to his trough. A little more than 500 people a day and in this country. Now, what's interesting about this chart, that was, again, April of 2020. Why did, the, why did the numbers go up? Pretty simple explanation. That was in the midst of a presidential campaign, and every Democrat presidential candidate pledged that they would end deportations, they'd give free health care. And the world took notice. People started coming in in anticipation of President Biden taking office. And then once President Biden took office, the catastrophe began. And again, President Biden, now he claims he doesn't have the authority. No, he has all the authority that President Trump had to close the border. President Biden, Secretary Marcus, used that exact same authority purposefully, willfully, to open up the border. So President Biden didn't need more laws. Secretary Mayorkas didn't need more laws to fix this problem. They caused the problem. They have the authority. We would have been happy to strengthen the authority, to overrule the floor's reinterpretation. But they weren't asking for that. All our Democrat colleagues wanted was political cover. That's the truth. So we went from humanitarian crisis under Obama of 2,200 people a day. Trump had almost 4,800 people a day, but he fixed it. President Biden, his record is 10,000, more than 10,000 people a day in December of last year. 10,000 people a day. During his entire administration, he's averaged 7,800 people in this country illegally because he has welcomed them. He's incentivized them. He wanted an open border. He caused this problem. And our Democrat colleagues would not even listen to evidence, would not let the House managers make their case of the lawlessness, of the willfulness, of the lying to Congress, because they didn't want the American people to see this. Now, I've shown this chart to Secretary Marcus. I'll show it to him again tomorrow when he comes for a committee. First time I showed this, you know, a couple of years ago, it looked almost as bad. But I asked him, Secretary Maricus, I mean, don't you recognize this is a crisis? And this is what he's saying, we've got a secure border. He wouldn't say it's a crisis. Well, would you at least admit it's a problem? No, Senator, it's a challenge. Now, I would view that as a lie. I would have liked to have heard the evidence presented by the House managers of other instances where Secretary Maricus lied to Congress, which, again, as I thought was definitely pointed out by a senator from Louisiana, isn't that a felony? And doesn't impeachment only have to be a mis misde misdemeanor? Again, so there's, there's so much wrong in what our Democrat colleagues did today by just summarily, cavalierly dismissing these charges. It's going to come back to haunt our country. But my final point will be this disaster, it's on a chart. It's numbers. They're colors. But the real disaster is with the individuals who've lost their lives, who've lost loved ones.
the children who have been raped, who have been caught in the crossfire of the gang wars. That's the real challenge, or that's the real catastrophe. That's the real problem. The Democrats just today swept under the rug. It's a travesty. It shouldn't have happened. But we'll continue to prosecute this case right up until November. Grateful for those insights that we've had from our friend and colleague, the distinguished senior senator from Wisconsin. <clears throat> you know, when the senior senator from Alabama uh, joined the United States Senate, uh, it was a pleasure to get to know him. It has uh, been a pleasure to work with him ever since then. In fact, I visited our southern border within a few months after he arrived here. And I noticed in him a uh, uh, distinct concern, not only for the welfare of the residents of the state of Alabama and uh, all other Americans, but also a genuine concern for those who have been human trafficked into our country by the drug cartels. And with the tacit acquiescence and even the affirmative blessing of this administration, I, for one, am glad that Senator Tuberville was not the head coach at the University of Miami when their football team played BYU in the late summer of 1990. Had he been, that game might have turned out differently. But I'd love to get his thoughts on this matter. It was, it was a pretty good game, by the way. It was a very good game. Indeed. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, from my colleague from uh, Utah, you know, I, I, I'm kind of amazed what's happened today. Uh, it's been categorized several ways, whether it's kangaroo court or a three-ring circus or organized grab ass. I don't know how you look at it, to be honest with you. Uh, it is amazing what we've sat here and watched. Uh, we all thought that last few weeks that there was a chance for an impeachment trial. Uh, of Secretary Mayorkas, uh, but it only lasted a few hours. It, a historic event in the eyes of every senator, not just Republicans, but also Democrats. Uh, but one thing I, I want to say is, you know, has he faithfully executed his duties uh, of the United States Constitution, one that we all put our hand on, on the Bible and swore to do? Uh, but it was amazing to me how this all went down at the end of the day. And it really wasn't Secretary Orcas's, uh He wasn't the only one on trial today uh, or would have gone on trial, impeachment trial. It would have been every Democrat. Every Democrat in here in the Senate, every Democrat in the House, and every Democrat that's running our, our executive branch because there's not been one person that says, has said anything since I've been here in three and a half years of, we need to do something at the border. Not one. Now we've let in 10 million illegal aliens in the last three years. From that data point alone, Secretary Mayorkas intentionally, intentionally failed to secure the border. I personally asked him one day why he was not at least given a fair chance of closing the border. He says, Senator, we, we need more money. Well, I looked it up, and his budget is 20% more than what President Trump's Secretary of Homeland Security uh, uh, had. 20%. So his job is Homeland Security. That's his entire job. Senator Schumer and all the Democrats could have, they could have conducted this impeachment trial today, and it would have never seen the light of day after the trial because we would not have had the votes on our side to impeach Secretary Mayorkas. So instead, the impeachment process is over. The media will stop covering in a few days. We'll be going back to throwing millions of taxpayer dollars at blue states so they can manage the surge of illegal aliens going to the blue cities all over the country. Just last week, the Department of Homeland Security awarded another $300 million to cities in support of illegal aliens. Today, the city of Denver announced that they would shift $8 million from their law enforcement to take care of illegal aliens. It's clear that the Biden administration is more concerned with taking care of, of these illegals than they are about protecting the citizens. So I will ask again, has Secretary Mayorkas fulfilled his oath of duty before this body to protect and defend the country against all threats, foreign and domestic, is our border secure? The answer is simple. 
He has not, and it is not. Mayorkas has been derelict in his duty, derelict, confrontational in his duty to all of us when we've asked him personally what he is doing at the southern border. In voting against his impeachment, our Democrat colleagues are they're basically lying to themselves. They're risking the lives of Americans. Senator Schumer and the Democrats can't say that they want to fix the border while trying to save his job. Americans are dying at the hands every day of what's going on from our southern border. Every, every state's a border state now. It's just not Texas. It's not Arizona and California. Every state. My state of Alabama is being overrun with illegal aliens. The number of people crossing the border who are not on the terrorist watch, who are on the terrorist watch list is unprecedented. That's what scares me. You listen to our FBI director, he says, we have a major threat to our country. And he said, it is coming. But it doesn't seem like anybody's listening. Nobody's listening that's in charge. Just last week, it was reported that an Afghan on the FBI terror watch list has been in the U.S. for almost a year. He's a member of, the, of a U.S.-designated terrorist group responsible for the deaths of at least nine American soldiers and civilians in Afghanistan. Nine. ICE arrested him in San Antonio just last year in February. Unfortunately, this known terrorist has been released on bond and is now roaming the neighborhoods in the United States of America. It isn't just terrorists. It's, always, you know, it's all, also fentanyl. We've had 100,000 people a year die in the last three years. Last time I looked, that's 300,000 people. It is a crime what's going on. Law enforcement officers in Alabama tell me that they had never heard the word fentanyl until three years ago. Not heard the word. It was heroin, it was cocaine, it was meth. Now it is almost 100% fentanyl, just in the last three years. That's a pretty good coincidence. In February, last, uh, this past year, uh, Secretary Mayorkas traveled to Austria to speak with Chinese officials about counter-narcotics efforts. Now, he traveled to Austria to do that. He discussed with them the flood of Chinese. Did he, did he discuss the Chinese flood of people coming to our country? 22,000 Chinese illegals have come into our country just in the last five months. Most of these individuals are adult males. And I wonder where we get the idea that there might be a big problem coming to America soon. Yet the media tries to act like all the people that's coming here from China and all these other countries are, you know, uh, great people. Some of them probably are, but most probably are not. They're coming here for different reasons. This is not a border crisis. It's turned into a huge invasion. It's a national security problem and we're having it more and more each day. So I just want to say this. We have not done, done our duty here today. We have failed the American people. My phone rings constantly about protecting the sancti sanctity of not just Alabama, but everybody in this country from what's happening at the southern border. Nothing at good is happening because of what's happened from Secretary Mayorkas to the people that have open these borders, again, not just southern, but also northern border. That is getting worse and worse. So we fail the American people today. That's why I don't know that we don't do our job. We had a Republican majority when I first got here three years ago. We brought the President of the United States in an impeachment trial, and he was a Republican. And what, we put him on trial in this very room. This is all politics. We broke something today that has never been done in the history of this, in the history of the school. I mean, excuse me, school. I'm, I'm used to getting on people when, when their phones ring in the classroom when I was coaching, but it's never happened before. Now we've set a precedent, and unfortunately, it will be, be a precedent probably that will be broken many times. How is this body ever going to be able to hold anybody accountable to anything that they've done wrong? here in the federal government. Thank you, Coach. Another one of our colleagues who's been a longtime advocate of secure borders, who's tireless in her advocacy 
uh, is our friend and colleague, the senior senator from the state of Tennessee. I'd love to get her thoughts on what happened today. Hey, thank you so much to the senator from Utah for organizing this. You know, Madam President, I think it is so important for the American people to really understand what did happen here today. And what we saw happen here today is a violation of our oath, the oath that we take that we are going to abide by the Constitution. Now, those who are watching this, and I would encourage all of my colleagues among us to pull out that Constitution and read Article 1, Section 2, which lays out the process of impeachment for the House of Representatives. And then Section 3 of that Constitution lays out the duty of the Senate in that Constitution. Now, I have a poster up here from 2019. It is Chuck Schumer. This was during the Trump impeachment in 2019. Now, Chuck Schumer, who's currently the majority leader, basically made a full-time job of talking about how the Senate had to do their constitutional duty to hold a trial. That's all he talked about for days. The clips are all over the internet. One thing he repeatedly said, we have a responsibility to let the facts come out. A responsibility. Now, we have to say what has changed between 2019, 2020, and today. Well, of course, we know what changed for Chuck Schumer because he's desperate to hold on to the majority in this House. And he did not want some of the senators who are highly contested in their races to have to take a vote on the Mayorkas impeachment. Why is that, Madam President? It is because the number one issue with the American people is that open southern border. And who is it? that has regularly lied to this chamber, to the House, and to the American people about what's going on at the southern border, it is Secretary Alejandro Mayorkas. Repeatedly lied, repeatedly stood before the American people, stood before us in hearings and committees and said, the border is secure. Anyone who is watching, anyone who's ever been to that border, knows the border is not secure. They know that on the Mexico side of that border, it is being run by the cartels. You can spend an hour with the Border Patrol, and you will find out. Last year, there were people from 170 different countries that came to that southern border seeking entry. Not a one of them got here on their own. They get flown to Mexico, they pay the cartels, and the cartels bring them over. The cartels are making a fortune. We are paying the price. And we're paying this price because of the dereliction of duty carried out by Secretary Mayorkas the way he's not standing up for the Border Patrol, the way he's not standing up for the American people, that is an issue. And yes, a responsibility, did we have that responsibility? You bet we do. And that is why we are here on this floor to talk about this. Because our border, when you look at the drugs, the fentanyl, that are coming across that border and moving into communities across this state, this country, every state, a border state, every town, a border town, every single family affected are worried 
about the consequences of the border. Thousands of Americans dead from fentanyl poisoning. Other Americans that have become angel parents because their children, their spouses have been killed in auto accidents by criminal illegal aliens. What they have done to this country by opening that border, and you know the sad thing about this? It is very intentional. They, this is their border policy. They intend to do this. So looking at the drugs, looking at the crime and the gangs, and then, of course, looking at the human trafficking. I, on Mayorkas' watch, and Madam President, this is something that is so important for the American people to know. In Tennessee, we have several groups that work on human trafficking and seek to rescue women and girls and children that are being trafficked, sexually trafficked. The exploitation of these children. And we know that is driven by the cartels. The cartels have turned human trafficking in this country from a $500 million a year industry over the last three and a half years, it has become a 13 billion, with the B. People are being trafficked. Indeed, children are being used as, as aids for these traffickers. They're being recycled. And these precious children have their name, they have the contact name and the phone number in indelible ink written on their backs written on their arms, because the cartel uses these children to get cartel members across the border posing as families. And then, once that cartel member is in the U.S., they turn that child loose, and then the child gets sent back. That is disgusting. But because of Biden and Mayorkas and the open border, that is what is happening. Now, even worse, we have an issue that Secretary Mayorkas claims he knew nothing about, and it was the loss of 85,000 migrant children. Now, we've got 400,000 migrant children that have been turned over to the federal government under Secretary Mayorkas. Out of this, 85,000 of those children cannot be accounted for. We've asked Secretary Becerra, we've asked Secretary Mayorkas, where are these children? They do not know. They do not know if these 85,000 children are dead or alive. They do not know if they've been attached to drug mules or drug traffickers or if they've been put into gangs, labor crews. What we did find out from some reporters, Madam Secretary, is this. We found out that some of these children were working in slaughterhouses in the night. That's what we found out. No, oh, by the way, that was from a New York Times reporter. This situation at the southern border is a humanitarian crisis. The trafficking of human beings is a crisis. Using human beings as chattel, that is a crisis. Putting people into indentured servitude and slavery, that is a crisis. And who has lied about this repeatedly to the Senate, to the House, is Secretary Alejandro Mayorkas. And who voted for it? Every Democrat on that side of the aisle that refused to let this trial come forward, each and every one, you are responsible for this not coming to light. It is a dereliction of your constitutional duty and a responsibility, yes,
It is a responsibility that we as members have to make certain that the American people know what happened today. Thank you, Senator Blackburn. Another uh, great mind uh, we've all benefited from in the Senate is um, our friend and colleague, this is the um, junior senator from Florida. Before he became the senator from Florida, Senator Scott was previously Governor Scott, a governor of one of the most heavily populated states in America. Uh, and prior to that, he's, uh, he was famous in the business world, personally employing hundreds of thousands of people. So the Department of Homeland Security is, a, is an enormous organization. Nobody understands how best to run an enormous organization and to do so with uh, exceptional skill uh, better than Senator Scott, and nobody understands better than him now the, the buck stops with the person running that organization. We'd love to hear from him now. I, think I want to thank my colleague from, um, from Utah for his, um, his commitment to the rule of law, his commitment to the Constitution, um, all of his efforts today and every day he's been up here to make sure that the Senate follows the Constitution, um, doesn't set precedents that don't make any sense, and today is a horrible day. So. I also want to thank my colleague from uh, Wisconsin for being such a, a voice on making sure that the public actually knows what's going on here. Um, the information he puts out, the charts he uses, um, the information he has gives everybody an, an idea of what's actually going on. So, but unfortunately today, Democrats' assault on American dem democracy had a banner day. Uh, Democrats in the Senate say, said that impeachments by the United States House of Rep Representatives don't matter anymore. They have to have a trial. They don't matter. According to what Democrats uh, did today, we don't need to hold impeachment trials here in the Senate ever. This is a horrible precedent. It's not what the Constitution envisioned. It doesn't matter if, for example, you're a cabinet secretary and that you've instructed your agency to ignore the law and not execute the laws of the United States. It doesn't matter if I order an agency to ignore the laws of the United States, Americans are murdered. They are, they have been. It doesn't matter if I order an agency to ignore the laws of the United States, deadly fentanyl pours into our communities and poisons our children and our grandchildren. It doesn't matter if I order an agency to ignore the laws of the United States, terrorists on the FBI terrorist watch list and migrants with known gang affiliations stream into our country. To such an extent that the FBI director testified sitting right next to Secretary Mayorkas before Congress that this is the most dangerous time in America since 9-11. Just stop and think about it for your family for a second. Think about either your mom or your dad, your spouse, your brother or your sister, a child or a grandchild, niece or nephew, just think of one of them. Just pick one of them. You cherish, you love them. You can think of wonderful things about them. Now, for thousands of American families, that person that you're thinking about today is dead. Let me say it again. For thousands of American families, the person that you're thinking about today is dead. They've been taken too soon by the deadly fentanyl crisis that have ravaged our nation because of the wide open southern border. Every one of us, every one of us knows some family that has been ripped apart by the deadly fentanyl crisis. Everybody does. Some of us have been impacted directly. Fentanyl is killing 70,000 people a year. Now, that's 70,000 families that are torn apart because we have an open southern border. This happened in part because instead of letting our brave border patrol do their job and stop these deadly drugs, Secretary Mayorkas intentionally is using them to let even more people illegally cross the border and come to our country and get all sorts of nice services. They get phones, they get lawyers, they get hotel rooms, all paid for by the U.S. taxpayer. Every victim of Secretary America's order for his agency has a name. 
Everybody's got to admit, think about, just think about that family member. I've heard a lot of heart, heartbreaking stories from people at my house, or my home, it's my home state. Florida families are feeling the impact of this administration's lawless border crisis every single day. Deadly fentanyl, criminals, terrorists, human traffickers. They pour across Biden's open border. This is all intentional. There are 1,145 children between 14 and 18 years old who died from fentanyl in 2021. So that's like having a classroom of kids die every week. Every week. In 2022, I heard from a mom in Kissimmee, just outside Orlando, where her son was in the Air Force, and he had a bright future in the Air Force. He came home to surprise her on a Mother's Day weekend. He unfortunately visited an old friend who he didn't know had been uh, dealing drugs. The, the friend convinced the young man to take a Xanax, which was unknowingly laced with fentanyl. The mom, the mom found him dead. He came home to just surprise her for her birthday. He's dead. Put yourself in position that mom. What, do you, what is she thinking about today? What is she thinking about when she watches this in the floor and every Democrat says, the guy that made the decision to open the southern border will not be held accountable. This 26-year-old Ashley Dunn is another American we've lost to fentanyl poisoning. Ashley's mother, Josephine Dunn, says their daughter did not overdose, but was poisoned by one half of one Percocet tablet that was counterfeit. According to Ms. Dunn, her daughter was murdered by products made in Mexico that were welcomed into this country by Mayorkas and his administration. Today, Senate Democrats made certain that Secretary Mayorkas will never have to answer. He's never going to answer for Ashley's death. He's never going to have to answer for any of the other deaths. But you know what? He'll know what he did. People know too much of what he did. He'll never, ever, he'll never get away with this. America is a more dangerous place because Mallorca's and Biden have allowed criminals, drugs, terrorists, and other dangerous people into our communities all over the country. Real Americans with families are being killed. Real American families are being torn apart by vicious crimes and deadly drugs because we have, wide, we have a wide open southern border. If you go to the southern border on the other side, they have IDs everywhere because they don't want the people, the Border Patrol that meets them on our side, to know who they are. Why would you do that? Secretary Mayorkas is the first and only sitting cabinet secretary to be impeached. He will always be known as the first sitting cabinet secretary to be impeached. And now he's forever going to be blocked from being acquitted of that charge. Or how that makes him feel. He will never get that chance to be acquitted because of what the Senate Democrats did today. I still have a question for my Senate Dem colleagues. Did you silence Mayorkas today because Democrats are terrified of his record and unable to defend him? Or just because they don't trust him? Whatever the answer is, the thing that every reporter here and every American needs to understand is this. Democrats put politics over the safety of American families and the security of our great nation today. I fear the consequences of that unprecedented failure will be devastating beyond our worst fears. I think it's going to take decades to rid the criminals from this country. And in the meantime, how many people like Ashley are going to lose their life? How many people are going to be raped? How many people are going to put in, be put into slavery. Yeah, I hope to God it doesn't happen to your family. Thank you. Grateful uh, comments that have been made by, by so many colleagues today in this colloquy and for the insights that they've shared. Each comes from a different state, bringing a, a different set of perspectives to the table, a different set of political and professional perspectives that 
help them shed light on this important issue and provide insights and warnings about the rather grave implications that we so cavalierly overlooked today. We, meaning the Senate as a whole, with 49 of us trying to stand in the way and raise a word of warning about what we're doing and what implications that might have for the future. The warning signs are everywhere. And tragically, um, we've seen just in uh, the last few days with news breaking in recent hours, <clears throat> that the consequences of our open borders policy can touch all of us with uh, one of our, our dear respected colleagues having lost a beloved staff, mem staff member within the last few days. Having lost that staff member as a consequence of the actions taken by an immigrant in this country who is here unlawfully, who shouldn't have been here. That's a, a troubling thing, but the, on a human level, this has so many ramifications. There are so many thousands of families, so many hundreds of thousands, in fact, so many millions, and in fact, tens, and depending on how you slice it, hundreds of millions of Americans who have been impacted in real, meaningful ways by the open borders policy that has been so prominently featured by these articles of impeachment. Over, uh, over three decades ago, I, I spent two years along the U.S.-Mexico border down in the, in the McAllen, Texas region. Served as a missionary, and as a missionary, uh, one lives and works among the people of all backgrounds. Uh, we spend a lot of time with, uh, with people of modest means. And in my case, I, I spent most of my time uh, with people of such humble means that, uh, of humble means that I'd never quite witnessed in the United States. Things, conditions that I didn't know existed on any widespread basis in the United States. Uh, including some people with dirt floors and no indoor plumbing. But in countless cases, those were a little bit more rare, but they, they exist, or at least they existed in the early 1990s. Even though those were more rare, those extreme cases, almost all the people I interacted with on a day-to-day -day basis were people of very humble means. We're living paycheck to paycheck, just trying to get by. And, and many of these people were themselves recent immigrants. Some, I suspect, were here legally. Others, I suspect, were here illegally. It wasn't, uh, it wasn't standard practice at the time for missionaries talking to people to find out their immigration status. We were there for different reasons. But you get to know people. You get to know their backgrounds. You get to know their concerns. One of the things that stands out from my memories of those two years is that I interacted with, as I interacted with these people and learned their customs and learned their language, um, most of them didn't speak English. Some who didn't speak English had, had themselves lived in the United States most or all of their lives. In fact, there were some people, especially in the older, older generations, whose families had been in Texas uh, for a very long time, for generations. And some of those older generations of people were raised speaking largely, if not exclusively, Spanish. But regardless of their immigration background or how, whether their, their family had been in Texas for generations or for only days or weeks, and whether they came legally or illegally, something I learned about them was that there's no one who fears uncontrolled waves of illegal immigration in quite the same way. And to quite the same degree as recent immigrants, especially recent immigrants of humble means living on or near the U.S.-Mexico border. You see, because, Mr. President, it's, it's their schools, 
It's their jobs, it's their neighborhoods, their homes, their children, their families, who are most directly affected by these uncontrolled waves of illegal immigration. Because it's those things, Mr. President, that are at their doorstep. They know that every one of those things are placed in grave jeopardy every time the floodgates open and people pour across our border into the United States without legal authority to be here. Every single time that happens, that has adverse consequences. We've talked a lot about the more obvious and the more newsworthy, um, the more news covered implications of open borders with situations like Lake and Riley. Hitting the news, but we, we don't always talk about how it affects, how it affects other people in, in more uh, mundane, more pedestrian ways. I think we have to be mindful of and, and really watch out for the tendency of those of us who are privileged enough to serve in this body to otherize immigrants, to otherize anyone with an Hispanic surname, to otherize anyone by, among other things, assuming that those groups of people speak monolithically or that we speak for them insofar as we uh, are seen as advocating uh, a position that is tolerant of or even eager to embrace open borders. It's not the full picture. And it's one of the more blatantly uh, awful Authorizations that we bring about in our society is assuming that someone with an Hispanic surname, someone who may be a recent immigrant themselves, would necessarily want open borders. It's simply not true. And, and it, uh, it, it speaks profound Im ignorance uh, uh, to, to, the, to the plight of these individuals when we claim that they speak monolithically, especially insofar as we're suggesting, even indirectly, that they're for open borders just because of their last name or the, their first language or how recently they arrived in the United States or where they live in the United States relative to the border. <coughs> Getting back to the bigger picture here and to what specifically happened today, When I think about the uh, 13, uh, going on 13 and a half years that I've spent in the United States Senate, I don't think of, I, I don't think I can uh, remember another day when something of such profoundly disastrous consequences was done in this body to shatter norms, rules, precedents, legal traditions and in this case, constitutional principles, quite like this decision here today did. Remember, just, just before Thanksgiving in 2013, I had been in the Senate not yet three years. It was just, um, just days before Thanksgiving, just before we, we broke for the Thanksgiving recess, when um, a group of my colleagues, all of one particular party, uh, decided to nuke the executive filibuster, decided to break the rules of the Senate in order to change the rules of the Senate, not by changing the rules themselves, <coughs> because changing the rules themselves takes 67 votes, but instead, uh, by a simple majority vote, they created new precedent to undercut and flip the meaning of one of the Senate rules. Getting rid of the cloture rule with regard to the executive calendar. I spoke to a lot of people after that happened, people of both political parties, including some of both political parties even within this body, who serve in this body, who, who expressed um, regret over that day and concerns for where it could lead. But 
particularly when I heard from people not serving in this body, I, I heard from people of all walks of life, including people of all political persuasions who acknowledged the profound um, consequences that could have and would eventually have on the United States Senate. Because again, it, it involved um, a rather shameless, uh, cynical maneuver whereby the, the Senate broke the rules of the Senate in order to change the rules of the Senate without actually changing the rules. Pretending that the rules said A, not B, when in fact they said B, not A. I think it may have been Abraham Lincoln who once said that he asked rhetorically, uh, if, if you count a dog's tail as a leg, how many legs does the dog have? Whenever he asked this to any, any individual, they would tend to say, understandably, accepting the, the framework of his hypothetical, well, that'd be five legs. He would respond by saying, no, it's not five legs. Even if you call the tail of a dog a leg, it's still not a leg. Now, that's what we did when we nuked the executive filibuster on that fateful day in November 2013. In countless ways, what happened today was far worse than that. Because what was at stake today was, was not just the rules, traditions, precedents, and norms of this body. Rules, precedents, traditions, and norms that, that I would add here have at no moment in our nearly two and a half century existence countenanced a result like what we achieved today. That is to say, we, we, we've never had something like this where we've had articles of impeachment passed by the House of Representatives transmitted to the United States Senate at a moment when the person impeached was neither dead nor a person who had left the office that that person held, nor a person ineligible for impeachment, meaning the member of the House or Senate, Members of the House or Senate can be expelled by their respective bodies by a two-thirds supermajority vote, but they're not subject to impeachment per se. If we carve out those narrow, rare exceptions where articles of impeachment have been cast in a way that were, you know, patently wrong where subject matter jurisdiction in this body was lacking either at the time the articles were passed or between the time they were passed in the House and the time that they arrived in the Senate. We have what I think can fairly be characterized as essentially a, a perfect record, at least a consistent record, in that we at least held a trial. We at least held the bare bones of a trial in which we had arguments presented by lawyers uh, uh, at a minimum by uh, lawyers representing the House of Representatives. They're known as impeachment managers, sometimes described colloquially as House prosecutors. We've at least, at least heard arguments by them. And normally that involves a presentation of evidence uh, by them, by the House impeachment managers. Normally it involves uh, both sides having lawyers, not just the House impeachment managers, uh, but also defense counsel representing the impeached individual. And normally there's, there's been evidence presented and arguments made about why the uh, articles of impeachment either were or were not meritorious. And in every one of those circumstances, with the narrow exceptions that I've described as the sole exceptions, there has been at least some finding on at least some uh, uh, of, uh, of those articles in every single case culminating in a verdict, a verdict of guilty or not guilty. So that by itself is a, is a precedent and a norm and a custom and a tradition and a set of rules that we've overlooked today
and that we've run roughshod right over. But there's something much more at stake, something much more concerning about this that I find so troubling, and that is that, you know, the, <clears throat> under Article 1, Section 3, Clause 6, the Senate's given the sole power, and with it the sacred responsibility and duty, to try all impeachments. Now, as I've just described, in every circumstance where there wasn't some jurisdictional defect, and by that I mean a bona fide subject matter jurisdictional defect such that we lacked jurisdiction to move forward, we've proceeded and reached some kind of a verdict in every one of those cases, but not today. You know, uh, Mr. President, I, I, I had been concerned for weeks. I had heard rumors for weeks that what was going to happen today was that the majority leader was going to approach these articles uh, with a certain degree of cavalier indifference and offer up a motion to table. I immediately became convinced after looking at the rules and studying the, uh, the precedent on this that, that a motion to table would be inappropriate here be inappropriate because, for the same reasons I've, I've just explained, we've never done that, never done anything close to that. The closest precedent for something like that was so far off course that it, it, it couldn't even be relied on. I, I recall the, the only precedent that even sounded like the same thing was, in fact, very different from that, in that during the... Um, trial over the impeachment of President Andrew Johnson, one senator had made a particular motion to do a particular thing during that trial, and another senator later moved to table that motion. There was no motion to table any articles of impeachment. In any event, I became convinced after studying this that a motion to table would be without precedent and um, you know, contrary to everything I thought I knew about our rule constitutionally and otherwise, to conduct impeachment trials. I also became convinced that this would be bad precedent and that it would set a certain precedent suggesting that it's okay if the party occupying the majority position in the United States Senate didn't want to conduct a trial, that it didn't have to. It could just sweep them aside. As I say, channeling the, the immortal words of Rush in the song Free Will, if you choose not to decide, you still have made a choice. You've made a bad one if you choose to just set aside the impeachment articles without rendering a verdict of guilty or not guilty, whether pursuant to a motion to table or otherwise. And I thought a motion to table would be a, an especially bad basis. Uh, uh, an especially bad strategy and a bad mode for disposing of and uh, otherwise addressing articles of impeachment. It's important in this context to remember that the United States Senate has exactly three states of being. We exist at any given moment, either in our capacity as legislators in a in legislative session. Secondly, in executive session, where we consider presidential nominations and also on occasion treaties for ratification, both executive functions carried out under our executive calendar. Our third state of being, being uh, exists in this context where we are to operate as a court of impeachment. It's solely in our capacity as um, senators sitting in a court of impeachment that we're administered a second separate oath, different from the oath that we all take each time we're elected or re-elected to the Senate different capacity, and it's a capacity that requires us 
to decide the case and, and, and to do so um, on the merits of the case. It's also unique in that it's the only mode in which there is a solid expectation unblemished until today in which if we do in fact have articles of impeachment over which we have subject matter jurisdiction that the case hasn't been rendered moot uh, where there is an expectation backed up by history tradition precedent in the text of the Constitution that we will do the job that in fact according to these precedents up until today that we will reach a verdict of guilty or not guilty by the time that we're done. You see, those things don't exist in the other two states of being. In our legislative calendar, there's no expectation or tradition or precedent or implication from the text of the Constitution that we will affirmatively act upon and ultimately dispose of every piece of legislation presented to the President, to, to, to the United States Senate. We don't do that. We've never taken that approach. But if we did, it would, um, you know, would grind the place to a halt. I, I don't think it would physically be possible. Nor has that ever been the expectation on the executive counter. Sure, we, we tend eventually to get to most of them, but there is an understanding that unless or until such time as we confirm a particular nominee, that nominee is not confirmed, such that if we get to the end of the road, the end of that Congress, the end even of a, of a session, if that person is to be confirmed, that person is to be renominated first and then considered by the Senate. But even then, there's no guarantee as to any final vote disposing of that nomination. This is different in the context of an impeachment, where we sit as a court of impeachment. We sit as a court of impeachment, and in so doing, we, we become two things. You know, in, in any trial, in an ordinary court, there are two functions that a trial involves. You, you, you've got to have finders of fact, that's a role typically played by a jury in our system, both in civil courts, civil cases, and in criminal cases. And you've got to have uh, judges of legal issues. Typically, those are performed by a judge. In some cases, um, most commonly, if the, if the parties agree to have the issues of fact decided by a judge rather than a jury, then you can have the whole thing, you know, the issues of fact and the issues of law decided by a judge. We serve both functions. We're finders of fact and judges of the law relevant to the impeachment case before us. You know, I think, Mr. President, that's the whole reason why we're given a separate oath for that. We don't take a separate oath every time we bring up a bill or every time we get a presidential nomination or every time we're asked to consider a treaty for ratification, but we do take a separate oath every time we receive articles of impeachment. And it's not just because these things are more rare than bills as they're introduced or nominations as they're received or treaties presented to us for potential ratification. It's because it's a, it's a sacred um, responsibility in which there is an expectation backed up by centuries of tradition, custom, precedent, and understanding of our constitutional text that will dispose of the case. We will dispose of it in a way that culminates in a finding of guilty or not guilty, except in these rare instances where we lack subject matter jurisdiction, most commonly because the case has been rendered moot, which it is not in this instance. The particular way in which we went this, about this today really was crazy and, and, and impossible to defend. Absolutely impossible to defend on its merits. Remember, there were two articles in these impeachment charges. Article 1 
alleged that in um, you know eight or nine different instances in which Secretary Mayorkas had an affirmative legal duty to detain illegal immigrants pending adjudication of uh, either of their asylum claims or of their, um, their, their, their argument that they might be entitled to some other form of relief, including immigration parole. The Secretary of Homeland Security had an affirmative duty to detain them while those decisions were pending. Eight or nine different statutes require that. And eight or nine different statutes he, he deliberately violated. He did the opposite of what the statute required. And by doing that, he invited and facilitated an invasion at our southern border that's unprecedented in American history, that's been dangerous, that's, been, that's resulted in all kinds of heinous uh, crimes being committed, uh, loss of life, loss of innocence, loss of um, property, many, many harms occurring as a result of this, occurring as a result of his, his deliberate <coughs> decision not only not to do the job he was hired to do and that he swore an oath to perform well, but to do the exact opposite of what their law required. I mentioned a little while ago the writings of Justice Story, Justice Joseph Story, one of our early Supreme Court justices a couple of centuries ago, He's familiar with the Constitution at a time closer to the founding, and also very familiar with the English legal antecedents on which the Constitution was predicated with the legal terminology incorporated from English law into the American constitutional system. And in his great uh, uh, treatise on the Constitution in section 798, he um, explained a few things about, about impeachable offenses. And he said in section 798, Quote, in examining the parliamentary history of impeachments, it'll be found that many offenses not easily definable by law and many of a purely political character have been deemed high crimes and misdemeanors worthy of this extraordinary remedy, close quote. This extraordinary remedy, of course, referring to impeachment. It then recites a, a, a litany of things that would qualify for this. And again, he, he just noted they don't necessarily have to be um, easily definable by law, and they are of a, of a political nature, but he, he identified some of those things that had been established through English legal precedent, uh, English parliamentary precedent, as worthy of impeachment, qualifying as high crimes and misdemeanors. Among other things, he identified um, what he referred to as attempts to subvert the fundamental laws. Attempts to subvert the fundamental laws. Well, this could have broad application in all sorts of areas, but I, I can think of few laws more fundamental to our republic, to our federal legal system, than our fundamental laws governing who may enter this country and under what circumstances. He went on to... Um, identify a, a number of other things that fit this definition. Adding to it, um, among other things, by saying um, one thing in particular that, that would meet the definition of high crimes and misdemeanors and would thus be impeachable would be an instance in, in which, quote, a Lord Admiral may have neglected the safeguard of the sea. So some on the other side of the aisle have argued that, well, really what Secretary Mayorkas did was to just not do as good of a job as he should have and could have in enforcing the law. And that can't be a basis for impeachment, they argue. 
some of them will invoke a line of reasoning that says um, maladministration, in other words, not doing your job well, isn't a valid basis for an impeachable offense. I'm not at all sure that that argument, even stated in the abstract, is, is, is accurate. In fact, I, I tend to think that it's not because the Constitution itself assigns that job to this branch of government, to the House, as it assesses whether to charge something as impeachable, and to the Senate, as it assesses whether an impeachment passed and presented by the House warrants conviction, removal from office. That really is, is our job, and as Justice Story noted, it's a, of a it includes offenses of a political character, regardless of whether they would amount to independently prosecutable criminal offenses in a, in a, um, a criminal court of law sense of that word. But in any event, this is even if you buy into that reasoning, they, they, there are those scholars who, who believe that. I, I seem to recall uh, Professor Alan Dershowitz, uh, the respected. Uh, Harvard Law professor from whom we've heard in past impeachment proceedings. I, I, I believe uh, he believes in this approach. But even under Professor Dershowitz's approach, he's, he's someone uh, for whom I have great respect, even where I disagree with him. Even if you were to accept that premise, this isn't just that. This goes far beyond just maladministration. It's not just that Secretary Mayorkas didn't do a, as good of a job as he could have and should have, and we wish he would have. It's that he, he willfully subverted what the law required and, and did the exact opposite of what the law required. That's impeachable. It's got to be impeachable. And, and yet, uh, the majority leader stood up today and he, and he said, I raise a point of order that impeachment article one, again, impeachment article one is the part that deals with Secretary Mayorkas's decision to do the exact opposite of what the law requires. The majority leader continued, uh, you know, impeachment article one does not allege conduct that rises to the level of a high crime or misdemeanor as required under Article 2, Section 4 of the United States Constitution and is therefore unconstitutional. I, 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 I really, um, I don't know how he gets there. They can't get there except by sheer force. And the way you do something by sheer force here is you produce a simple majority of votes from senators declaring the impeachment equivalent of uh, defining a, a tail of a dog to be a leg. What I found even more stunning was when, um, as stunning as that first move was, and as disappointing as it was that a simple majority of United States senators, all from the same political party, uh, I would add, not my own. He somehow managed to outdo that one by later making the same point of order with respect to Article 2, arguing that, uh, you know, he, he said, quote, I raise a point of order that impeachment Article 2 does not allege conduct that arises, that rises to the level of a high crime or misdemeanor as required under Article 2. Section 4 of the United States Constitution and is therefore unconstitutional. Let's remember what Article 2 was about. Article 2 charged Secretary Mayorkas with making, knowingly making false statements to Congress as Congress was carrying out its, its oversight responsibilities with him testifying often under oath to Congress. Now, unfortunately, we, we never got to hear any evidence on this. Therefore, we weren't presented with the opportunity to make a final determination on this. But 
We instead have the, the majority simply roll right over all of this by just declaring if state dicks it, it, it is because it is, it is because we say it is, that it's not an impeachable offense, even if, as has been alleged, and, and as the uh, House impeachment managers, the House prosecutors, as we sometimes call them, were denied the opportunity to try to prove that he knowingly made false statements to Congress. To say that that's not impeachable is breathtakingly frightening. We've now established this, a precedent in the United States Senate that if you occupy a high position of trust within the United States government, a cabinet member in this instance, and you knowingly, willfully make false statements to Congress as Congress is trying to get to the truth about what you're doing in your job and whether or not you're faithfully executing, implementing, and enforcing the law. That lying to Congress in that sense, even under oath, isn't an impeachable offense. That precedent could suggest that we've now effectively immunized from impeachment. Doing that very thing, how, how are we to conduct adequate oversight if even the theoretical threat, the theoretical, hypothetical, potential threat of impeachment isn't on the table? It severely weakens the fabric of our republic, it certainly weakens the ability of the United States Senate to push back on abuses by and within a coordinate branch of government. You know, when James Madison uh, expressed in the Federalist Papers, uh, uh, among other places in Federalist 51, that government was is sort of a, an experiment. It's, a, it's an exhibit. It's a, it's a display of human nature. There and in other Federalist Papers, he explains things like the, the fact that uh, it, it, as he continued in Federalist 51, that if, if, if we as human beings were angels, we wouldn't need government. If we had access to angels to run our government, we wouldn't need all these rules to govern those responsible for government. But alas, we're not angels. We don't have access to angels to run our government, so we need rules. Madison was also a big believer in the fact that because we're not angels, we don't have access to angels to run our government, and we do need these rules, You've got to set up a system in which power can be made to check power. And you set up each branch with its own set of, of incentives to guard against abuses of power. I've wondered over time as I've seen the United States Senate gradually but very steadily over many decades voluntarily relinquishing its power much of it started with our work on, on the legislative calendar, starting in earnest, really, in the, in the 1930s, but continuing to the present day. We've gradually, steadily been outsourcing a lot of our lawmaking power to unelected, unaccountable bureaucrats. Passed all sorts of laws saying, essentially, we shall have good law with respect to issue X, and we hereby delegate to department or commission or agency or functionary Y the power to promulgate rules carrying the force of generally applicable federal law as to issue X. 
Little by little, the American people lose control over their own government as this happens. Little by little, you start to see that this diminishes the overall accountability of the United States government. And when agency or department Y promulgates a particular rule carrying the force of generally applicable federal law, people understandably, predictably, very consistently come to us to complain, saying this is killing us. This, this rule made by unelected, unaccountable bureaucrats is now it's going to shut down my business. I'm going to be deprived of life, liberty, or property, or some combination of the three. Whether I choose to comply or not, it's going to, it's going to harm me in material ways. And yet, you know, Article 1, Section 1, Clause 1 says that all legislative powers here and granted shall be vested in a Congress of the United States, which shall consist of a Senate and a House of Representatives. Article 1, Section 7 makes abundantly clear what Article 1, Section 1 sets up, which is to say you cannot make a federal law without the assent of both the House of Representatives and the Senate on the same bill. They've got to pass the same bill text and then present it to the chief executive, the president of the United States, for signature, veto, or acquiescence. Unless you follow that formula of Article 1, Section 7, you're not supposed to be able to make a federal law. One of the more influential um, political philosophers on the founding generation is Charles de Montesquieu, who observed that the lawmaking power is itself non-delegable, that the uh, task of lawmaking involves the power to make law, not other lawmakers. Because as, as we see to this very day, when these things happen, when people come back to complain to us, that the administrative regulation carrying the force of generally applicable federal law when it causes problems people come and complain to us and then members of congress predictably and foreseeably beat their chests and they say oh yes those barbarians over at agency commission department why we didn't mean to authorize this. We just said make good law as to issue X. We didn't say to make bad law. And then predictably, the senators, the representatives say something like the following. You, you know what I'm going to do for you, constituent? I'm going to write them a harshly worded letter. That's what I'm going to do. As if that were our job that we were sworn in to do, was, were to write harshly worded letters. It's not that, of course. It's to make laws, not other lawmakers. You know, I keep these two stacks of documents behind my desk. One stack is small. It's usually a few inches, no more than a foot or so. It consists of the laws passed by Congress in the preceding year. It's just a, you know, a few thousand pages long. The other stack is 13 feet tall. During a typical year, it'll reach about 100,000 pages stacked up even on very thin paper, double-sided, small print, about 13 feet tall. It consists of last year's Federal Register, the annual cumulative index of these federal regulations as they're promulgated, as they're initially released for notice and comment, and later as they're finalized. Those rules carry the force of generally applicable federal law. Failure to abide by those can shut down your business, can result in enormous fines, in many cases can result in your imprisonment if you don't follow them. And yet they are not enacted themselves through the formula prescribed by Article 1, Section 7. No, because in that instance, we've authorized the making not of laws, but of other lawmakers, not ourselves. And those other lawmakers to whom we've given this assignment, while perhaps they, however well-educated and well-intentioned, wise, specialized, well-trained they might be, they don't stand accountable to the American people, ever. Their name will never appear on a ballot. In fact, their name will stand 
essentially as a secret to nearly every American, including those who will stand accountable to those laws, who may lose life, liberty, and property as a result of those things. It's not right. We all know deep down that it's not right. We know that every time we're presented with one of these complaints by our constituents, and we all have them. In my office, it's a nearly constant refrain. And yet they often precipitate the predictable, harshly worded letter and not a lot else. In other instances, they, they might culminate in uh, the filing of a resolution of disapproval under the Congressional Review Act. As fun as those can be, because they do give us at least an opportunity to debate them, those are privileged resolutions. You follow the rules of the Congressional Review Act, you can pretty much always get one of those voted on. You can at least have an opportunity to present those here in the United States Senate and to vote up or down as to whether or not you want to disapprove of the regulation in question. Ultimately, however, those proved dissatisfying from a constitutional standpoint in the sense that with very narrow exceptions, they don't really do any good because nearly any administration whose bureaucratic structures will promulgate the administrative rule in question will like, for policy reasons and political reasons, a policy choice embodied in those regulations. And consequently, the, mm -hmm. the president whose administration promulgated that it, the regulation being challenged under the CRA resolution of disapproval will almost always veto any resolution of disapproval passed by both houses of Congress. It's very rare that that doesn't happen. With only one exception I can think of from a few decades ago. The only time that works, other than that one exception that I'm thinking of, occurs when you've got a holdover, when you've got a new administration and you've got regulations that have been promulgated toward the tail end of the previous administration. We had a number of those when President Trump took office following uh, President Obama's time in office, where regulations from the Obama era were becoming ripe for CRA resolutions of disapproval, and we were able to get them passed by both houses of Congress and then signed by President Trump. But those circumstances are pretty rare. In every other circumstance, the voters of this great country, those subject to these administrative regulations that are, in fact, laws, those things leave us without redress. It's one of the reasons why I've long advocated for us to pass a, a measure called the RAINS Act. If a genie appeared to me and said, you can pass any one bill now pending in front of the United States Congress, it'd be the RAINS Act. Why? Well, because the RAINS Act would require us by statute to do what I believe the Constitution already requires, what it in fact does contemplate, uh, which is that it's fine for uh, administrative regulations to be promulgated, to be proposed, but unless or until they're affirmatively enacted into law, by both houses of Congress and then signed into law or acquiesced to by the sitting president or in the event of a veto, um, uh, if that veto is overridden by two thirds of both houses of Congress, then it can take effect. But short of that, no dice. You don't get a law. These do have far reaching effects, including the fact that, you know, as a member of the Judiciary Committee, I and a few of my colleagues tried to figure out a few years ago how many criminal offenses are on the books? How many 
different provisions of federal law prescribe criminal penalties and can re result in a criminal conviction. We asked this question of the Congressional Research Service, the, um, the, the entity to which we turn regularly in order to get answers to questions like those. The answer came back to us in a way that I found absolutely stunning. The answer that came back to us from the Congressional Research Service, very talented people at the Congressional Service who, who were very good at answering these questions, they did a good job doing it, and it, it, I'm convinced they gave us the answer that was possible to achieve this. If the answer is unknown and unknowable, but we know that it stands at at least 300,000 separate, separately defined criminal offenses on the books. Now, this does not mean that on 3, 300,000 plus occasions, both houses of Congress passed into law a separate statute defining a criminal offense with criminal penalties. No, in many, many of these instances, one of the reasons why the number is so difficult to tie down is because a lot of these are defined administratively. So that's one area in which the United States Senate has been deliberately um, uh, shirking its responsibilities and handing them off to somebody else, refusing to do the job that we've been given to do. We've also, so that was on the legislative calendar. We've done that time and time again, also on the executive calendar, where we've changed the law so as to limit, changed the law or in some cases adopted standing orders that have been embraced in subsequent iterations of the Senate, limiting the number of presidential nominees requiring confirmation. So we've narrowed our playing field there too, shirking our responsibility even as the size of the federal government has increased inexorably. We've narrowed our job. And now we've seen it done again today in our third state of being, in our third category where we operate as a court of impeachment. Where even here, where our job is really limited we have one job in this area, to conduct impeachment trials. There are a thousand ways you can conduct an impeachment trial. You can conduct an impeachment trial with the whole Senate. You can uh, specialize the impeachment trial so that it's, it's heard in the first instance by a select committee with members of both political parties who hear the evidence and then um, after doing that, submit the whole matter for a final vote to the whole Senate. You can hear evidence through individual witnesses. You can receive evidence in documentary form. There are a thousand different ways to conduct a trial, some of which allow the trial to be conducted pretty quickly. Others uh, might take more time. But there are a thousand ways we can do it. And here, as with the other two states of being, first on the legislative calendar, then on the executive calendar, now as we sit as a court of impeachment, we've narrowed our work again, shirking our responsibilities again, again declining to perform our constitutional duties. This is shameful. I'm embarrassed that we as a Senate seem so enamored with the idea that um, we can't do the, the things given to us. What's especially troubling about this is that, you know, uh, we are, in fact, a, uh, a government of, of limited enumerated powers. Our job is not to, as some people put it, to run the country. Our job is not to make law on any matter that we think appropriate or significant. Our job is not just to enact legislation in any area where we think it might redound in one way or another to the net benefit of the American people. No, we, we're supposed to be a government of limited, enumerated powers, charged with a few basic things. We're in charge of uniform system of weights and measures, a system of immigration and nationality laws,
regulating trade or commerce between the several states with foreign nations and with Indian tribes. We're in charge of declaring war, establishing and regulating an army and a navy, coming up with rules governing state militias, which we now describe, uh, refer to as National Guard. Pointing money, regulating the value thereof, coming up with bankruptcy laws, postal roads, post offices. Regulating, um, in some instances, um, federal land to be used for some military purpose. Regulating what we now call the District of Columbia, adopting rules governing the disposal, the regulation and uh, disposal of territory and, and other property owned by the United States. So there's my, one of my favorite powers of Congress <coughs> involves granting letters of mark and reprisal. Mark, in this instance, spelled M A R Q U E. We haven't done one of those in over a century. I hope we will sometime. I think we should. Letter of Mark and Reprisal is basically a hall pass issued by Congress that allows those acting pursuant to it to engage in acts of piracy on the high seas with the impunity offered by the United States if they're able to make it back with whatever loot they take into the United States and then divide the spoils and share the spoils with the United States government. And that's about it. And there, there are a few other powers of Congress here and there, but that, that's the lion's share of what the federal government can do. And of course, we occupy the most significant, prominent, dominant, and dangerous power within that because we're the lawmaking branch. We make the laws. The executive branch enforces the laws we make, deferring to our policies and enforcing the policies that we enact. The judicial branch, headed by the Supreme Court, just interprets them, not just in the abstract, but interprets them in a way so as to be able to resolve disputes properly brought before the jurisdiction of the courts, uh, disputes over the meaning of federal law. So we get the most dangerous, prominent, dominant position. It makes sense that the Founding Fathers entrusted that role only to us because we happen to be the branch of government most accountable to the people at the most regular intervals. You can fire all 35 members of the House every two years. You can fire one-third of the, body, the, the members of this body every two years. And that's one of the reasons why well, you know that the Founding Fathers considered the power that we wield the most dangerous because they made us subject to the most frequent um, and regular and direct kinds of uh, guarantees of accountability, that is, through elections. So now we've got somebody who's been impeached because a law that we passed that he was charged with enforcing and administrating, administering and implementing and executing didn't do his job. So it falls on us to decide that. We've got myriad instances in which that violation of the law can't be adjudicated in court, such as this case uh, we referred to earlier, Texas, uh, United States versus Texas where a majority of the Supreme Court of the United States against, by the way, a brilliant dissent by Justice Alito, concluded that the state of Texas didn't have standing to address the violations of law, the deviations from law of Secretary Mayorkas and the Biden administration. We, if not us, who? In countless instances, the courts can't do it. The executive branch isn't going to check the executive branch. The buck stops with us. It's our job to do this. And today we failed. We didn't just fail in the sense that we tried to do it and we didn't. We, the majority of us, unfortunately, tried not to, went out of our way to define our role as something that it's not, to define the law as saying something other than what it in fact says.
so that we can shirk our responsibilities yet again. Shame on us, shame on those members of this body who voted to do that today. I wonder what future generations will say about this. I wonder how many ways in which future generations will suffer from what we did today. I hope to shout that they'll take this as a lesson in what not to do and soon depart from this awful precedent because otherwise this will lead to the shedding of tears and worse. We're told that the Senate is apparently just too busy to conduct an impeachment trial. Just as we're about to be told that the Senate is too busy to require the federal government to get a warrant before searching the private communications of the American people incidentally collected and stored in the FISA 702 databases. Too busy to do those things, but I think we're about to be told that it's not too busy to send even more money to Ukraine, where we've already sent $113 billion. Not too busy to do that. Not too busy to expand FISA without adding a re warrant requirement, but just way too busy, apparently, to do what the Senate and only the Senate can do and what under the Constitution we must do. Madam President, like the ghost of Christmas future in Charles Dickens' A Christmas Story, I hope that as we examine our future and, and what today's action portends, portends about the future of the United States and of the United States Senate, I hope we can choose to depart from this course. While I fear that our past will prove to be our prologue, I sure hope we won't solidify and more deeply entrench this unwise, indefensible move that we took today. But I'm glad we've had the chance today to set the record straight, to make an adequate record of what really happened. And that while a majority, a bare, slim majority, chose to excuse the inexcusable today, some of us Nearly half of us tried to stand in front of that train and stop it. I, I hope that this will prove to be an aberration. Let's all pray that it does. Thank you, Madam President. I yield the floor.
President. The Majority Leader. I have eight requests for committees to meet during today's session of the Senate. They have the approval of the Majority and Minority Leaders. Duly noted. Madam President, I have unanimous consent that the Committee on Environment and Public Works be discharged from further consideration of H.R. 4389 and the Senate proceed to its immediate consideration. The clerk will report. H.R. 4389, an act to amend the Neotropical Migratory Bird Conservation Act to make improvements to that act and for other purposes. Is there objection to proceeding to the measure? I ask the bill be considered read a third time. Uh, well, objection, the committee is discharged and the Senate will proceed. Without objection, the committee is discharged and the Senate will proceed. I ask that the bill be considered read a third time. Without objection. I know of no further debate on the bill. Is there further debate? If not, the question is on passage of the bill. All in favor say aye. Aye. All, all opposed, no. The ayes appear to have it. The ayes do have it. The bill, is passed. the bill is passed. I ask unanimous consent. The motion to reconsider be considered late, made and laid upon the table. Without objection. And finally, Madam President, I ask unanimous consent that when the Senate completes its business today, it stand adjourned until 12 noon on Thursday, April 18th that following the prayer and pledge, the morning hour be deemed expired. The journal of proceedings be approved to date. The time for the two leaders be reserved for their use later in the day and morning business be closed. That upon the conclusion of morning business, the Senate resume consideration of the motion to proceed to calendar 365 H.R. 7888. Without objection, so ordered. If there's no further business to come before the Senate, I move that it stand adjourned under the previous order. The question is on the motion. All in favor say aye. Aye. Those opposed, no. The ayes appear to have it. The ayes do have it. The motion is agreed to. The Senate stands adjourned until 12 noon tomorrow.